It all started on the asphalt and sands of Daytona Beach in 1937 with a race called the Handlebar Derby, a 3.2 mile long course that drew 100 racers from around the U.S. By 1961, Daytona International Speedway founder Bill France Sr. brought the race to its current home at DIS. And through the 1970s and 80s, the race, simply known as the 200, was won by some of the world's biggest names. But now we turn our attention to a new generation of rider and motorcycle. New bikes, new rules, but a new winner? In this field of talented riders, three have already won the Daytona 200. Josh Heron in 2010, Brandon Posh last year, and Danny Eslick. The 35-year-old has won this race four times. Can Danny make history? Or will the likes of Moto America Superbike champion Jake Gagne, his teammate Cameron Peterson, veteran Josh Hayes, 2020 Supersport champ Richie Escalante, and more put a stop to Eslick's dream of being counted as one of the greats? So much is on the line as the high banks await the 80th running of the Daytona 200 right now. Are you ready for the Daytona 200 from Daytona International Speedway? One of the most unique races in all the world. We're wrapping up bike week here in Daytona Beach, Florida for 2022 as we get ready to send middleweight sport bikes onto the high banks at DIS. Hello everyone and welcome to Daytona International Speedway. The stage is set for the Daytona 200, the 80th running, a race that started all the way back in 1937, and here we are. Qualifying is done and dusted, and we have so much to talk about as we get you to the Daytona 200. But let's take a look at a couple things that make this race so unique. It is a solo endurance race, 57 laps. Riders are going to have to come in, and they're going to have to do pit stops. And fuel and tires will go into this, so it's a team effort. Also, pit board communication. Most of the time, riders are going to go out, and the pit board is going to give them information and they're going to get to just kind of roll around and read it. But now it's like, hey, you've got to come into this pit. Something riders have to think about, something different. And what about drafting? Here at Daytona International, drafting, you'll do more of it here than you will at all other Moto America tracks combined. And it is a learning curve. Now I'd like to welcome to the broadcast booth Jason Pridmore, two-time champ. Well, JP, here we are. We're getting ready for the 200, and it is quite a unique race. Yeah, and these teams have had to deal with weather and schedule changes and things like that. But like you say, it is a unique race. A lot of times when these teams are sending their rider out, it's for a quick sprint race. Not here, though. The teams are going to get involved. And we'll talk about the elements of what pit stops mean, the in and out laps and things like that, because they become so crucial in this race. Your pit team that you come into can really help decide this race. And the one thing we do about, know about this race is details matter. But, Jason, we've talked about pit stops, pit stops, motorcycle pit stops, not something you see every day. But we have two more members of our broadcast team on standby, Hannah Lopa. And right now we'll go down to Jamie Howe. Hey, Jamie. The Daytona 200 is the only Moto America sanctioned event that has a set of pit stop rules to be used in competition. So what are these stops going to look like? Well, from the time the rider enters pit lane, they have a maximum speed of 37 miles per hour. And at that point, they're allowed six crew members to go out over the wall, but one of them has to be dedicated to the fire extinguisher while the fuel is going in. Teams did have the option to switch from their single fuel cap to a double aviation style system to speed up the process, also to make it go faster. They're allowed to do fuel, tires, and any repairs using pneumatic tools all at the same time. This is something new. It's something different. Teams have been practicing it. There was even a pit stop demonstration earlier in the weekend where the Ducati team took home the winning honors. And while the pit stops are going to be a big factor in this race, they're not the only unique aspect here of racing at Daytona. For more, here's Hannah Lopa. One of the most unique and challenging features here at Daytona International Speedway is, of course, none other than the banking. It is unlike any other circuit on our calendar. And, of course, it comes with its own set of challenges at a whopping 31-degree slope. To the untrained eye, it would be easy to assume that our riders are running straight up and down or perpendicular to that banking, when in reality, they're doing a left-hand turn. This is going to create a lot of tire wear on the right-hand side of the tire, which is why our manufacturers have brought a specific compound, especially for that banking. Now, top speeds we're seeing here in our Supersport class this weekend are about 170 miles per hour. And now, Greg, it's pretty incredible that our riders will be among the very long list of illustrious racers that have ridden on those banks before them. 
And there's no denying that the high banks here at Daytona, Jason, are a defining factor, but it's also a bit of a problem for tire manufacturers over the years. Yeah, there's no question. As a rider, when you would come here, you'd always hear about how riders were having to be good in one spot, not good in another because tire wear and things, but that's not the case anymore. These tire manufacturers have worked really hard to produce a tire here at Daytona that's going to see you through to that pit stop window for a full, what, 18 to 20 laps. So the tires don't go off as bad as they used to. Riders don't complain about that as much anymore. If you're a regular Moto America viewer, you know that Dunlop's the control tire, but this is Daytona 200. It's different. There is a tire battle going on, and Jason, Dunlop has 28 riders that showed up running their tires. Pirelli 16, Michelin 4, and Bridgestone 1. Yeah, it's great to see that again as far as all these manufacturers want to have that competition. So you can see that Dunlop is pretty much dominated here, but don't let that fool you. There are some top teams on Pirelli. Pirelli has won this race the last couple of years, so they are here to win again. And the tire talk, well, it's going to continue during the entire 200. But, Jay, we wanted to highlight a couple of racers. Unique is Sheridan Marias. This is his first time that he's going to be able to race the Daytona 200, but he's got a lot of experience in his 30s, but he was our second fastest qualifier. A great rider. Obviously, I've known Sheridan for a while. A mainstay in the World Endurance stage at the moment. He's also ridden World Supersport. He's got a very qualified team around him that is going to be really good at pit stops. So I think you're going to see Sheridan there. As you say, Greg, a little bit older experience. He's going to be able to use that. But when we talk about older and experience, <laughs> let's talk about Josh Hayes. Josh Hayes, we don't know how many more years he's going to run the Daytona 200. And this is the one box that he hasn't really clicked off yet. He's going to have to start from the back of the grip, but don't let that come as any big surprise to anybody. He's still going to be there at the end. I think that he's going to work his way through this on that first uh, leg before the first pit stop. And he'll be there at the end of this race. Very savvy. It's going to be fun to watch Josh Hayes rip through this field. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daytona International Speedway and today's 80th running of the Daytona 200. Please direct your attention to my right-hand side as we welcome the president of Daytona International Speedway, Mr. Frank Kelleher. On behalf of the Harris Brands family, entire staff here at Daytona International Speedway, welcome to the World Center of Racing. We're thrilled to be hosting the 80th running of the Daytona 200. We know these riders are ready to put on a great show, so enjoy. Thanks, Mr. Keller. Offering today's invocation, please welcome teaching pastor of Riverbend Community Church in Ormond Beach, Mr. Scott Menez. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness that you show to all people. We thank you for your grace to clear the weather we ask for safety for these drivers and pit crews and safety teams, Lord. Bless this race, Lord. Thank you for our freedom here. Help us protect it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, a couple of weeks ago, the entire Moto America paddock was rocked by the tragic and sudden death of one of our family members, a former champion and a friend. Jason Aguilar, who sadly passed away at the tender age of 24 years. A former champion, we ask you all now to share a moment's silence in memory of Jason Aguilar. Now here to perform the national anthem of the United States of America. Please, ladies and gentlemen, stand as we welcome from Palm Coast, Florida, Melissa Trumbull. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous path oh the ramparts we watched were so gallantly
Ladies and gentlemen, Melissa Trimble. Right, we are just a couple of minutes away then from the start of the 80th running of the Daytona 200. We're down on the grid. The pit crews are ready. Really excited to be here. I've seen this race so many times from a small, being a small child with my family back in the UK. Now here in Pit Road, just look down here. We can see the grid is starting to form up. I am so excited. Uh, we can see down here the number 16 of Kevin Almeida. Josh Hayes is here as well. All good, Josh. Yeah, he's going to be starting from the back of the grid, but he promised me yesterday you guys are in for a show. Right there, let's move along down here if we can, guys, from the TSE Racing Team. A shout out to Harry and Matt Truller. Uh, from the UK, of course. Uh, everybody getting excited down here. Scott Smart, I've got about 35 seconds. Scott, you are the FIM technical director. You and your team are responsible uh, for the homologation of a lot of these new next-gen machines. A proud moment for you and for all of the motorcycling world. This is the next-generation super sport. In about 200 miles, I'll give you an opinion as whether I'm not proud or not. But yeah, I think we're, I think we're pretty close with the performance of the bikes and just fingers crossed we're going to have an awesome race. Great job, and uh, I don't know about you, uh, looking at Moto America Live Plus, twins at uh, Daytona, what do you reckon? Cheers, Scott. H have a good one, buddy. Right then, very quickly, all eyes, all focus are now on the grid. There is Brandon Parsh over here, the defending champion front row here. There is Josh Herron and uh, his wife on the front row of the grid. Uh, Gerard and Marais in the middle of the front row, and on the outside of front row of the grid, the attack Yamaha. We're going to hand it back to the boys. We're ready for lights out. Today's coverage of the Daytona 200 is brought to you by Pirelli, where power is nothing without control. All right, welcome back to the 80th running of the Daytona 200 as 57 laps are scheduled for this one. And as we look at the grid, obviously they've already done some qualifying. Yesterday there was a time attack where they took the top 12 qualifiers and they all put them in a session and said, go as fast as you can. And this guy, number two, Josh Heron, your 2010 champ, was able to pull out an extraordinary lap and go 150.088. Josh Heron, Jason, the track record owner from a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was a frantic last session there for those guys because of the weather. We were trying to get a condensed schedule put together. They got them together, and Heron did come through in that session and put that thing on pole, and I believe Jamie's with him now. It was a frantic session for J Josh Heron, and you admittedly said that you got a little hot-headed out there. This is an endurance race. What's going to be the key for you to stay patient? Oh, it, just what you said, just be patient. Remember, it's an endurance race. Uh, it's a sprint race after the second pit stop. But, uh, you know, the guys at the uh, Warhorse HSBK Ducati team have been working really hard to get this V2 ready. And, uh, you know, I'm just ready to go out there and fight. It's been 12 years since I won this thing, but, uh, you know, I'm ready to win another one. I uh, just got to thank uh, Competition Works, Medallia, Parts Unlimited, everybody else involved, Fresh and Lean, Arai Helmets. Fresh, you know, uh, only fans can't forget that one. <laughs> but uh, just want to have a good time. Hopefully, we have a you know good, safe race. Not a lot of uh, stopping in the race, and uh, yeah, put on a good show for the fans. Former champ starting at the back or at the front. There's another one starting at the back, Hannah. Well, Jamie, unfortunately, due to an infraction, Josh Hayes will be starting from the back of the grid during this race. Josh, how crucial are those first few laps, especially the first lap, in order to have a successful race? Uh, you know, I think actually it's just got to be clean, but I I'm pretty lucky the Squid Hunter racing team, they've done a fantastic job. We had one little snafu that put us on the back of the grid, but it's been a fantastic bike. We've been near the front of every single session we've been on track, and you know, I've had a, a few opportunities in my career to do something special, maybe even heroic. And so I'm going to try to channel my uh, Scott Russell and see if I can uh, figure out how to get there from the back of the grid. But I feel good that uh, I can keep charging. I, can, I know I can put 57 hard laps together. And if these guys give me a sniff, I'm hoping I can make them regret it. Well, best of luck out there to Josh Hayes, a very tenacious Josh Hayes. Jamie, who have you got on the grid out here? For Brandon Posh, he is the defending Daytona 200 winner. You're starting on the second road this year. What's different in 2022? Uh, yeah, I'm on a different bike, different team. 
Uh, it's Moto America Ran. Everything's different. So, uh, yeah, I mean, same plan for me. Just get out there and see how the race goes. I can't thank the whole TOBC Racing Triumph team enough for everything they've done this weekend. It's been a hell of a weekend for me. Super fun. And, yeah, we got one more session to go and enjoy it and hopefully come home with a good result. This is the one that counts. 57 laps. You see his helmet is on. Riders are all getting ready to go. One rider that we weren't sure if he was going to make it out or not, that was Jake Gagne. This morning during the warm-up session, he was exiting pit lane forgot to pump the brakes as he was as he was leaving. By the time he remembered to do it, it was too late. He was going too fast through the corner, exiting the racetrack. They got the bike put back together. They had to start from a brand new frame. The team had the time with the rain delay to get that work done. But for you today, Jake, coming out, how are you physically feeling? It was a rough start to the morning for sure, but uh, you know, these guys got this Yamaha R6 back together and the only way to figure it out is to go out there and try, see how we feel, and so uh, it's a long race, so we'll see what we can do. Jake, put this head down, Hannah. Well, Jamie, is uh, Richie Escalante is putting on the finishing touches of his gear, just Velcroing up these gloves. Let's see if I can get a word with him. Richie, after a really tough championship last year, you're now on your competitor's team, a new team for you, a new motorcycle, and a new track. How are you coping with all of those challenges heading into this race? Yeah, really happy to ride for the Team Hammer, Vision William for Extra Suzuki. Uh, this weekend is a little bit difficult, you know, the weather not helps too much. So I working on the bike this uh, this yesterday uh, and to this morning. So I feel great. So this long race, so I be to be smart and do my best. Uh, the plan is for sure is win. So uh, I'm ready. Best of luck out there, Richie. Greg, 57 laps ahead. Yeah, 57 laps around a 3.56 mile Daytona International Speedway. And taking a look at it, the total amount of corners in this one are 12, but the distinguishing factor, of course, is the high banks. But to navigate this racetrack well, you also have to get through that infield road course just enough so you can catch that draft. This is gonna be an exciting race at a famed racetrack. You don't wanna miss anything. The start of the Daytona 200 is going to be coming up after the break. We'll be back with that. Don't go anywhere. Well, Roger, right, I've made it back up from the grid. I can tell you the tension, the excitement down there. Speaking to Paolo Ciabatti, it's real. This is going to be one hell of a race. It can, and what I think why the tension's so high, there's a lot more that goes into this race. Most races are, you know, 20 to 25 laps. There's no cautions, there's no or no red flags that, as much as they're like pit stops. Um, you know, I think for a guy like Josh Hayes, he's going to want to see a red flag. So he doesn't want anybody to get hurt, but, you know, he wants to bunch the group back up as he's coming through the pack. And then also, not only is there one pit stop, there's two pit pit stops so there's a lot that goes into this race not only for the riders but the crews the rider has to be patient early uh, they're going to come into a lot of lap traffic uh, this, there's just so much that comes into play here and uh, not only is the rider got to be smart fast consistent the crew as well you can win or lose this race on a bad pit stop yeah, absolutely. We saw yesterday. We've shown it a few times already today as well. The pit stop challenge. All of these teams uh, practicing over and over and over again uh, because, of course, they don't want to let their riders down just as much as the riders don't want to let them, them down. No, I mean, you come in and have a bad pit stop, you could lose the draft. And it's going to, if you're out there by yourself, it could be hard to, to pick it back up, to catch back up, to get in a lead draft. So every time, all the time is valuable. Also getting on and off pit lane. You know, that's going to be crucial for these guys. You don't want to go too slow, but you also don't want to get a pit lane speeding penalty. So there's a lot that goes into this. You can just tell how nervous everybody is. And I think the reason that is, is it's like... Oh, and have we got a problem here? Have we got a problem for uh, for the number four of Josh Hayes? Uh, or is that just uh, being pushed? I'm not sure what's going on there. He's being pushed away, so I'm not sure what is happening there. We'll find out and bring that to you uh, in a few minutes' time. Right then, we're getting ready for... And there is a problem. There is a problem. He's at pit exit, so I don't know. Yeah, no, they're pushing him off. They are pushing him off. So I'm sure that Greg White and Jason Pridmore will have a bit more information. We're getting ready for the warm-up lap. The Daytona 200 is about to start. Let's hand it back to Greg and to Jason as we get ready for lights out here at the World Center of Racing.
Welcome back to Daytona International Speedway for the 80th running of the Daytona 200. And you can see Josh Hayes, who didn't take the sighting lap, but that's no big deal. Let's look at the grid. Jason Pridmore, Heron, Sheridan Marias, and Jake Gagne on the front row. Then we got Brandon Posh, Richie Escalante, and Cam Peterson starting there on row number two. Then three, Danny Eslick, Max Angles, Kevin Almeida, Jeff May, Sam Lockoff, who I think we should pay attention to during this race, and Mike Selpy. Hayden Gillum, Chris Paris, Carl Soltis, and then we have the True Love Brothers. Both Matt and Harry come over from England with Jason Waters just outside of row six, Luke Power, Rocco Landers, Cody Wyman, Miranda. And Greg, as we go further back through this field, there's gonna be some guys here with a lot of experience, and there's gonna be some guys here with no experience. And for the guys here that we start to see, it's gonna be really important that they just get off to a good clean start this first lap. It's gonna be a lot of congestion down in that turn one in both horseshoes that we see. They gotta get themselves in a good position and let this race kind of get in, into play for them. Now, the fact that Josh Hayes is coming from the back, it's gonna be very, very crucial for Josh to understand that when he goes down the back straightaway, and this is the experience you'll see from this guy, the experience that he's going to have coming down that back straightaway, as you can see Josh there, row 15 on the inside, 43rd starting spot. If he can get himself somewhere up in the top 25 before the back straightaway, the biggest problem is, is he doesn't want to get drawn into that draft too much going into the chicane and make that early mistake. So it's going to be important that he gets to the front. But on the same side, he's going to be coming through a lot of different levels of experience of riders in front of him. So he's going to have to keep an eye out for that. Yeah, those riders that are kind of in 10th position through maybe 30th position going into the chicane on the off the back straightaway for the first time, that's going to be the first opportunity they've ever had to feel what a 10 or 20 bike rider draft is. And it's important to hit your brake marker. Or it's also important to not run off on uh, your warm-up lap. As Sheridan is Marias. Sheridan? And, and yeah. I'll tell you, you know, you bring that up. And I was just going to make a point of this because... I'll tell you, one of the, the biggest things that I would be concerned from right now, especially running off in the chicane or things, the amount of rain that we've had, that grass is going to be beyond slick. I mean, way more slick than normal. Big puddles, we had huge downpours here, so I can only imagine what's out there. Normally, if you run off the grass, you can kind of get through it, but if you run off the grass now, it could cause a big problem, and when you're tipping in into that chicane off the back straightaway and it goes left, if you haven't made it to where you think you could make it back to the right and you have to cut across the grass, it can impact yourself and a lot of other people so this first run down this back straightaway that the guys are on right now on their warm-up lap is going to be crucial for a lot of people from 12th back now looking at josh hayes we talked about he's going to be starting last on the grid but thinking about the strategy that he and his squid hunter team put together josh didn't go out for the sighting lap because normally he'd be penalized for not going out to the sighting lap by being, being put to the back of the grid but what josh hayes and his team did that's to their advantage is they didn't burn an extra lap of fuel because unlike some other Daytona 200s in the past, the rule here was after the sighting lap, you couldn't top your motorcycle off then to do this warm up lap and go. So in terms of fuel consumption, Josh Hayes has one extra lap in his tank. Now, what does that mean? We're going to see pit lap windows somewhere around what, Jason, 17 to 20 laps, 21 laps. We're going to see riders start coming in and it's a two pit stop, stop strategy for most people in the Daytona 200. Some people might have to do more if they have issues. And it also depends on tire wear. We're going to see some riders probably try to go one or maybe even both stints on the same front tire. They won't change them to try to gain that track position. So it's going to be very uh, crucial for the, the crews when these guys come into the pit lane that they can get a good glance at what their tires look like and whatever decisions they've made prior to the start of the race uh, and make sure that, that that can be validated by a quick look at the tires when they come in. The world's first look at the new look super sport category. Very similar machines going to be running in World Superbike. It's done here at the Daytona 200. As you look at a Ducati, that's a V2, a 955 twin going up against an inline four-cylinder R6. And you have Triumph triples at 765 cc's. And this is what the future looks like in terms of super sport moving forward. And it's done for the first time right here in the United States. So the final bikes lining up. 14 rows of competitors, 110% of the fastest lap defined who would make this race and who wouldn't after 52 people tried to make the field for the Daytona 200. So the field looks set and ready to go. 57 laps in this one. This first lap, so critical, but the one thing we do know, you can't win it on the first lap. We have riders in the back that are still trying to form up. 
get in their right grid position. And here we go. This is nervous time for a lot of the riders right now, and everybody's trying to get a plan to get down into this first turn, Greg. And that's what we got to see. We got to see a good, solid, clean first turn from all these guys and the first run into the International Horseshoe. Here we go. The 80th running of the Daytona 200. It's underway, and Josh Heron let the clutch out. It looks like he got a good launch on that Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York entry. And it looked like a triumph jumping into second place. It is. It's Brandon Posh with Marias. And you can see Cam Peterson there. Danny Eslick is in there as well. So the run down. Here we go. We got riders down in the back already. Down into turn one. That was our fear. A lot of riders being channeled into a very small spot down there. Oh, and Eslick looks like uh, Cameron. Looks like Max Angles, I think, went up underneath. Is that Max Angles on the green 64? Went up underneath Eslick, I think. Yeah, Cam Peterson got roughed up a little bit too. Ooh, you can see a little bit wide there from Heron. So Josh Heron on the number two. And that 96, Brandon Posh on that TOBC Racing Triumph. So a couple of these next generation motorcycles out front. Now we're gonna get our first look at the legs of this Ducati. Oh, and Heron a little wide coming oh, out of the bank. So he Marias. Marias looks like he's got a problem already as he's pulled up. By the way, I looked in the back there, and it looks like Josh Hayes has already got himself up close to that top 20, Greg. So he's had a tremendous run through traffic in the first half of this lap. Out in front right now, though, we've got a pair of Triumphs leading the way. TOBC bikes out front, one, two. Eslick goes up underneath Posh as they go down into the chicane with Heron there in third. Danny Eslick. Four times a Daytona 200 winner, trying to rewrite history and put his name next to the greats like Scott Russell and Miguel Duhamel at five wins apiece. It's early days, the first lap, but he takes over the early lead, and there's drafting and passing on the banking all over the place. And how about this incredible first lap? It looks like for Max Angles there on the, in the green here, Greg, running third now as he goes up alongside Heron as they come down the run to the tri-oval camp. Peterson in the draft of Heron, and who is going to lead on the very first lap of this 200? Looks like it's going to be Danny Eslick leading the way over his teammate. Heron there in third, Angles, Peterson, and it looks like Escalante now making a run around the outside of angles as they dip into turn one. So we start to see our first group formed up. It is Danny Eslick on the 69 and 96 is his teammate Brandon Posh. Richie Escalante in the mix as well on the 54. His first real run on the Vision Wheel M4 X-Star Suzuki GSX-R 600. Josh Hayes on the right part of your screen, trying to make up all that time. He's already 14th. He's already 14th, so he's going to get a sniff of this draft really, really early. And his tires are still good, Greg, so this is important. You know, he obviously got a great start and was able to get through as many people as he could. He is up on the back of, let's see, who is, looks like Carl Soltese or Hayden Gillum maybe, that he's up behind. Nope, it's Carl Soltese up behind right now. And he's going to get a nice run. And that lead draft, you can see him there in the bottom left part of your screen coming out behind all these guys. On the right side of your screen, you can get a better look at what he's doing as he gets in the draft to Saltees as they get ready to go down the back straightaway. But the two triumphs still leading. Escalante closing in third. Another pass for the lead, as you'll see multiple times in this race. And how about the legs on that GSXR 600? Old school versus new school. Max Angles back there in fifth spot on the Kawasaki. You can see how, how careful Danny Essex being going over that inside curving in the second part of the chicane, the first part of the chicane where it dips back to the right. Two laps in a row now. He's gone over it fairly upright before leaning the bike in, but we have our defending 200 champion Brandon Posh leading the way. Big drafting going on right now from Escalante, and Heron's going to squeeze up alongside the wall as they come down this front straightaway, Greg. Posh will lead lap two. Five wide on the banking at Daytona. Max Angles doing a great job on the 64, the Kawasaki. Oh, and it looks like Escalante going a little bit wide, trying to get that motorcycle slowed down. And that's straight up because the bikes are heavy right now. you got to remember, this is only the second lap. They're going to do 20 laps or so on this set of first tires that they're on. Bikes are heavy, a little harder to slow down. Look who's coming back there at the back of this pack. Look at that yellow bike. Josh Hayes is in the lead draft already. This is right where he needs to be. Now he can start to settle himself a little bit, see who the guys are, make sure that nobody's getting away too much up at the front, and now he can run his race. So Posh in the infield. Josh Heron trying to find a way around. 
So it's Triumph versus Ducati versus Yamaha R6. As Cam Peterson, who was our provisional pole sitter in the first day here at Daytona for this 200 race on Thursday. Peterson trying to turn it tight and get a good run up out of the banking. Josh Heron a little wider move. We'll see the legs on that attack performance. Yamaha R6 of Peterson. Max Angles continues to run the line. He wants to run a little bit lower than most of them. But look at that Yamaha holding off the advances of that Ducati. And here comes the Suzuki. Double draft, triple draft. Into the chicane they go, Jason. And it's got to be Cameron Peterson. So Cam P all of a sudden to the front. Angles trying to find some room. Heron gets held up a little bit. Can't use the line that he wanted. This has got to be so exciting for Max Engels right now to see himself leading up at the front with these guys that he's been trying to get close to. We've seen him at other Moto America races. He's always in that second group, third group, and he's moving himself forward year to year. Right now, he's got himself in this lead group firmly planted, and he's trying to draft his way through, as you see Heron giving hand signals already, and it looks like I'm just looking to see if something's happened there. Nope, nothing's happened there. But Heron's going to lead as they go down into turn one. So Josh Heron in turn one. Fastest lap of the race, by the way, credited to Josh Hayes so far on lap number two. They just finished three laps. That's lap traffic up ahead. So Josh Heron, if he can hold on to this position, he's got to try to get around lap traffic as soon as he can. Traffic's got to know they're coming. Oh, a little wide. So something must have happened here to see traffic as early as we have. And this big group of riders is going to go steamrolling past. So Josh Aaron leads the way, Jamie. I spoke to him just before this race started, and he said that keeping his head down was going to be the biggest factor for him. They have all of the team in place that they need. They have everything uh, in their right positions, and, and they're not too worried about the bike making it there. They feel really confident in the program that they've put together. It's going to be about execution. It's going to be about making sure that the pit stops go according to plan. It's going to be about him not making any mistakes out on the racetrack. Yeah, and Jay, it just doesn't seem like Josh has got the line to get up out of the banking for the first time as these inline fours able to turn underneath that Ducati, but this is a long way to the first pit stop as we continue to see these lead changes and riders continue to learn about drafting and passing. And this for Camp Peterson, who leads the way at the moment. It's his first trip to Daytona and the Daytona 200. Now both the TOBC bikes just been shuffled back slightly here. Top three guys, just a tiny little bit of gap over, I believe it's Escalante and the TOBC bikes. You can see Josh Hayes on the top part of the banking just behind them. Looks like he's running with Sam Lockoff. Lockoff, I'll tell you, Greg, he's really impressed me last year. He's been riding that 600 well during the offseason also, and uh, he'll just sit there and watch this thing. This kid's intelligent. He's not going to do anything too brash to start with, and he understands what's going on. I've been peeping an eye also. Sheridan Marias is, got himself back into 12th after we saw him go off into turn six on the opening lap, and he's lost a little bit of touch with these guys. So let's see if that number 113 of Marias can continue to keep going forward, and Escalante gets in there way too deep. Now he's in the ground. Greg. He's going to get back on pavement, but that's a huge mistake from the 54. So Richie Escalante, he gathers it back up as he was making a bid for the front. Now Cameron Peterson trying to pull the pin. Oh, and Josh Heron with a mistake. He couldn't get the bike slowed down. Nearly collected Max Angles through the infield. And I cannot believe who's in fifth place already. I can't believe it. Yeah, That's why we spent a lot of time it. talking about it. it. Yeah, because absolutely. we knew that he had the pace and the experience to work his way through the field. And now Josh Hayes can take a breather. He was hey. able to work his way up right to the front. And he's watching guys in front of him make mistakes. This guy's got more experience than any of them. This is a four-time Superbike champion that has come back and wanting to win a race that he's never really got a chance to win. And you can see right now, Greg, as he heads down the back straightaway, he's moved himself into third. Every one of these guys know where that number four came from, all the way in the back. And now he is here. And he has been pretty steadfast in saying he's here for 57 laps. He knows he can do it. He's been putting in time. So now it's just going to be race intelligence and there's nobody on the track that has more than this guy right now now josh is up to third front two guys getting away how about max angles still going back and forth here with cam peterson angles leads the daytona 200 as they come to the tri-oval so now a kawasaki zx6r max, Ang max angles racing team from miami florida tons of laps around daytona has taken over the lead from cameron peterson 
You can see Jake Gagne. I was watching, Greg. I saw him not going around, and I was wondering when he was going to pull off. And you can see Gagne just a little bit too banged up from that uh, off this morning going down pit lane. Jake has had to walk the, the duration of pit lane to get back to the paddock area after retiring from this race. He said out on the grid that he just wasn't sure if he was physically going to be able to do it or not. He made the call early on. Why risk it for, the, for this one off uh, 600 race for him for the season? He needs to heal himself. He's been back in the transporter all day resting and, and trying to get better, but it just wasn't enough time for him today. A valiant effort for Jake Gagne to get on that motorcycle and get out here is another mistake. Heron got really wide through the key, through the kink there, and uh, it just threw his braking off a little bit. That's why you saw him get in there wide. Eska's able to take advantage of that. And you can see these two guys going back and forth. Angle slides it back up underneath his cam, lights the rear tire up, coming up onto the banking. And see, all that stuff means a lot more when you know you got to do as many laps as these guys have to do around this track. Now, Hayes is going to take back to that front there in third. He's got Danny Eslick, I believe, right behind him right now. They have broken away a little bit from, and I can see Pop behind them so I'm not sure what's going on with Heron Heron's dropped back to what there Greg sixth place now he was third to start the lap not sure how Posh got by him but these two guys out front just keep drafting and redrafting all right little wheel in the air as we often see but Max Angles leads away from Cameron Peterson Hannah Greg, we know Cameron Peterson to be a really smart rider on the track, and I've been talking to him throughout the weekend. He's been so calm and collected, you know, despite this being his first ever endurance race, his first time at this track with a new team. He's never even done a pit stop, and he hasn't ridden an R6 since 2015. I said, are you worried about any of that? He said, it really helps knowing that Richard Samboli has won this race before, and he really feels like he has the best package underneath him in order to be successful. Uh, Brandon Posh in wide, and that's all that draft, Greg, and you can see it. These guys are the top guys. That's the guy that won the 200 last year. So easy to make a mistake and getting sucked into that draft down at the end of the straight. And look at here. Essek goes up underneath, and that's what you got to do if you're Josh Hayes. You feel that? You're not going to just let just close the door and shut somebody off in a in a long 200. And you can see Eslick's going by his pit board with his arm up for some reason. Not sure what that's going to be. But there's so many little intricacies that go on during the course of this race. And riders are continuously trying to evaluate. But you saw Hayes with good racecraft there. Just let Eslick slide up underneath him and, and not cause any big problems. Looking a little bit further back, Greg, see Hayden Gillum there in ninth. We haven't got to talk about him much, but he's in this group. As you can see right off the back here, he's on that orange and blue bike. Another very well-versed guy is Hayden Gillum. And how about Harry Trulev? The Trulev brothers right now come to Daytona. He is running in eighth right now. Tremendous job from the 444 on the Yamaha riding for TSE Racing. And you know what, Jason, looking at Danny Eslick, Josh Heron, and Josh Hayes, all so much experience here at Daytona. Of course, Heron mentioned that he had won this race 12 years ago, four times for Danny Eslick. Hayes actually won this race a number of years ago, Jason, but unfortunately in post-race tech inspection, he was disqualified. So he has come across the line of the 201st before, and all that experience matters. Onto the banking they go, that 31 degrees of high speed. These motorcycles reaching in excess of 177 miles an hour for some of them. Josh Heron and his Ducati trying to hold off the advances of this triple Ducati. And here comes Josh Hayes again. Now, Jason, the one thing I'll tell you is there's no panic that these two riders are out front the way they are. They don't need to reel them in immediately. It's all about just keeping in tow, keeping them in sight, and seeing what their teams have to do in the pit stops. So. Eight laps done of 57. Can Cameron Peterson and Max Angles continue to lead? Danny Max has, Angles continues to lead, Jay. And it looks like Danny has got a problem. I saw him with his leg off going down into turn one on the right side of the bike. I saw him come out of there, and you can see he's kind of falling back. Posh has gone by him on this lap. Escalante's there with him now. I don't know exactly what's going on with Danny, but there's a lot of gesturing, not to any of the riders. It just looks like he's got a problem of some sort. So some of the gesturing to the riders just looks like it's a warning that maybe he's had a problem of some sort. 
And you can see up in front, Cam Peterson and Angle side by side as they go up on the banking. Heron and Hayes close that gap down a little bit on this lap to the front too. Now, let's keep an eye on Essek. It looks like his bike is running pretty well when he gets up on the bankings. Uh, I can't see anything that's making me think we got a red flag. So maybe there's something on the track or something like that that these riders are feeling, Greg, but there's a red flag out right now. Rider down. That looks like it's coming up. Is that coming out of the chicane? It is it that, looks like it's coming out of the chicane. It looks like possibly. it's yeah. It looks like it's Jose Loretta, out of Colombia on the MRC BX Racing Yamaha R6. And you can see that's a tough block cover. It looks like Greg that maybe he has hit as he's exited the chicane and he's gotten gotten contact with that that cover. Yeah, you can see debris out on the racetrack. There's the motorcycle at rest in the grass. So now it's up to the AMA FIM crew here, Moto America. They're going to inspect the racetrack under red flag conditions. Now, Jason, this is what's interesting about the red flag situation. In Daytona 200 pasts, riders could top off the fuel, do anything they want, change tires. But in this particular case, there's no tire changes allowed, Jason. And we still have 50 laps to go. So we've ran seven of our laps. These guys' pit windows were going to be between 18 and 20 like you and I had discussed. So they're going to have to come in in 10, 12 laps anyway. So you're going to see kind of a 10 or 12 lap sprint race. And then you're going to see uh, guys going back out on, on fresh new tires, fresh new rubber now. This will also help a few of the riders behind that maybe lost toe and, and, uh, and go from there. And, of course, now Josh Hayes is going to get to come from the second row rather than the last. All right, we'll step away as the red flag conditions continue and clean up on the racetrack and helping the, ri the downed rider out. So we'll step away for a moment. We'll be back with more from the Daytona 200, the 80th running. Paolo Giabatti on the left-hand side looks at Josh Heron, who was uh, in that lead group. Roger Hayden alongside me, Michael Hill. Uh, we are under red flag conditions in this Daytona 200 uh, as the corner workers and marshals uh, just clear up some of the debris. Good news, Roger, is rider is okay. Motorcycle, however, uh, a little bit second-hand, and uh, we'll have one rider less when we start, uh, or when we restart, should I say. Max Angles, uh, what an incredible performance so far by the Kawasaki rider. We haven't really talked about Kawasaki at all in the build-up to this, and uh, maybe we should have, because uh, Max Angles has uh, steadily been going about his business. There he is, just uh, wiping some moisture off his face, uh, fuel going in and of course uh, I didn't think you were allowed to, to refuel are you allowed to refuel or is it tires you can't change I'm not familiar with tires okay so you can refuel just not tires okay so it's slightly different rules to the to the World Endurance Championship and uh, will, will we see all of these riders now taking advantage of this I guess you would wouldn't you, you? would and uh, you can't change tires and let under a red flag unless Dunlop states that you you know there's a problem with your tire or whatever gotcha. and if you do then you have to start in the box so I'll, nobody will be changing tires unless somebody has a big issue and, and dunlop would have to decide that and you would start in the back but like you said max angles i mean he's riding great looks like he hasn't put a wheel wrong looks really fast and smooth and kind of setting the pace for this daytona 200 early him and cam peterson kind of looked like they were working pretty well together not going back and forth and you know, the, the first five laps was kind of like what we expected. It was one big group, and usually it stays like that to the the uh, first pit stops, but, you know, they kind of broke up the group a little bit. Yeah, it was interesting, and we're looking at the pace there at the front set by Max Angles on the uh, 64 Kawasaki. 51, low 51s. Fastest guys on the circuit, Kevin Almeida, 1 minute 50.7. Uh, not sure what happened with Kevin in the early laps, but he was steadily making his way forward. And Kevin Almeida uh, riding for the N2 team, 115.7 uh, miles an hour average speed, uh, Roger, on the Super Sport machines. But also running in the 1-minute 50s on uh, the early part of this race was Sheridan Marias, 1-minute 50.9. So uh, we are seeing some, uh, some pretty quick times uh, from these guys. We also mentioned uh, Dunlop, but let's not forget, this is not a single-tire race. We have Pirelli, uh, Michelin, 
Dublin and Bridgestone riders in this race as well. Will that now affect things? You know, everyone's going to refuel. I get that. But, you know, will these tyres go different distances? I mean, is that something else that we haven't really talked about it? We don't really know. Yeah, you don't really know. And also with the lack of track time these guys had in the weather, you're not really sure how long a lot of these tyres will go. But that's the thing that makes it so important and uh, cool and something to watch about the tire war is who's got the tire that's going to last the longest who's got the one that's going to be consistent for 17 or 18 laps or however long they're going to go till till their pit stops and then also when there's a red flag like this whose tire is going to heat cycle better some tires heat cycle better than others and they don't have that same feeling so we're gonna we're gonna see whenever this race gets back underway who struggles with the heat cycle and then you know pit stops aren't going to be too far away yeah, very good point, uh, Roger. Uh, of course, there are 50 laps remaining in this race, and I know quite a few people watching uh, from Europe are asking the question on social media. What happens now? Is it an aggregate race? How does it work? And, uh, of course, we were just talking about that, Roger, because I wasn't sure. This is not an aggregate race. When we have a red flag, it works very similar to other championships around the world. The grid for the restart will be based on the grid, or rather the running order, uh, from the race as it stands. So the front row of the grid, get this, Max Angles will start from pole position. Cam Peterson will start second. Front row of the grid, Josh Hayes. He said he promised us a show, and uh, in seven laps, he's worked his way from the back into contention. There is Cameron Peterson, and uh, I like that new rule. I mean, years ago, it didn't used to be like that, did it? They'd, they'd have this aggregate race, and that's yes. so difficult to follow. They'll, they'll go back to the, the last completely uh, completed lap, and that, gotcha. that'll, okay. that'll start the grid. Uh, you know, they're not going to take any laps away. Like some races, you know, you go and there's a red flag. They might take two or three laps away, but you have to go 200 miles. So they can't take any laps away from the from the race. So they're still going to have 50 laps to go. The last completed lap, it's going to help some guys like Sheridan Morais who had that issue. Uh, Richie Escalante, who ran off the track, kind of gives them a second chance to kind of regroup now that everybody's going to bunch back up. We saw a couple of riders uh, with uh, potential problems. We didn't see what happened to Sheridan Marais. This is also a bit of a lifeline for him. It gives him the opportunity under these red flag conditions to talk to the team, to say, hey, look, this is the problem I'm having. Maybe it's a, a shifter, maybe whatever it is. Uh, but this will give them a bit of an advantage, not an advantage, but a, a bit of a respite, give them a chance to, 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 to make those changes uh, and come back and still be in the fight. Yeah, make a few changes. And also, it kind of looked like uh, Danny Eslick was looking around a little bit before that red. I don't know if he was just kind of seeing who was around him or, or what but also for these guys get to see how their bike felt on a, a full fuel tank maybe it made things a little bit different so they're going to get time to kind of talk with their crew if you're in the front group i'm assuming you're not going to make a ton of changes but uh, if, if you had an issue or if you made a mistake uh, now you get a chance to get back out there and for josh now you know he's going to start on the the front row so for him he came he came quick the beginning of the race those guys were going back and forth a lot their lap times were in the minute 52s and uh he cut that pack within five laps yeah, absolutely. The uh, third member of uh, our broadcast team, Jamie Howe, is down in pit lane. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, she's managed to work her way through the uh, throng of people down there. And she's with uh, the current leader of the Daytona 200, Max Angles. Uh, Jamie, uh, are you with Max? Uh, I think she is. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we have a small technical problem uh, there. We're not hearing uh, Jamie or Max at the moment. We'll try and get that fixed and uh, come back to uh, Jamie down there. And uh, it's so busy down there, isn't it? So even if yeah. we could uh, have the microphone working properly, we probably still wouldn't hear him because there's so much noise. And you can tell just how nervous he is, and you would be. The first time you're leading your first professional race, not only the first time leading a professional race, but leading the Daytona 200, setting the pace. I can only imagine... Uh, the, the nerves that he's feeling, but it looks like on the track he's handling it pretty good because he's not making any mistakes. Looks pretty smooth. What's going on down there? One of the Vision Wheel uh, M4 X-Star Suzuki's. Looks like they're just trying to prize the pads uh, there. I mean, I'm not a technical guy. I'm not a mechanic, but definitely they're looking at doing something with the front brakes there on one of the yeah. machines. Can't see who's that, whose bike that I, is. I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe it's Escalante's bike because he had that little bit of issue, but this gives all the mechanics. They're always looking at the bikes, all, just making sure constantly there's not a problem. Just gives them another chance to look them over really well, and maybe he's... Uh, you know, maybe his brakes wasn't as good as he likes, so maybe they can bleed the brakes or just make a couple of small adjustments while they have time. 
Yeah, and again, just to, uh, to clarify the rules here, you cannot change tyres under a red flag situation. I'm assuming other parts you can. So if a rider came in and wanted to change a brake lever, for example, they could do that, right? They could change a shift lever, uh, you know, anything like that, gear lever, they could change that? Yeah, I mean, you've seen guys change clutches during red flags, so you can change uh, just about anything you want, like you, but like you said, you can't change tyres unless there isn't an issue, and Dunlop would make that decision, and if you did, you'd have to start in the back. Uh, of course, uh, tyre strategy, one part of the equation, and also fuel strategy uh, as well. And now with this red flag, does that, I guess that changes the calculations as well for the guys. They've run, okay, limited laps uh, because of the weather. Uh, but, oh, and there is the, uh, the second-hand machine uh, down there. We can report, if you are just joining us, uh, these are live pictures from the Daytona 200. Rider is okay uh, following an incident coming out of the, uh, the chicane, we think it was. Uh, a little bit of work uh, on that motorcycle. I think it's safe to say he won't be making the restart. No, not at all, but luckily, I mean, looking at that bike, it's just so thankful to see Absolutely. him get up and uh, be able to, to walk away. He's not going to finish this Daytona 200, but he'll have his opportunity again. Absolutely, absolutely, uh, and good work from the uh, corner workers and the marshals. We haven't got an update yet as to when we can expect the, res uh, the resumption of this race, but let's give you a rundown while we have a little bit of time of the runners and riders. Max Angles was leading this race by 49 one hundredths of a second. Uh, we saw a number of riders, a leading group of 10 in that uh, first part of the race. Cameron Peterson, who will ride for the uh, Attack Yamaha team in the Moto America Superbike Championship, was running second Josh Hayes uh, who had to start uh, towards the rear of the uh, grid had worked his way through into third position Danny Eslick Josh Herrin who started on pole and the defending champion Brandon Pash Escalante we saw have a bit of a moment he was running seventh ahead of Hayden Gillum Olmedo as well who also had a bit of an issue at the start running ninth Harry Trulove uh, uh, the guys mentioned it in the live broadcast uh, Harry Trulove who will be racing in the British Supersport Championship uh, his teammate uh, uh, is of course his brother Matt Trulove and also I saw in the paddock yesterday uh, um, Brad Peary who is the teammate to the Trulove's uh, in the British Championship he's over here as well that's impressive for uh, for Harry Trulove yeah really impressive and for him uh, this is a great opportunity for him to get out with these guys that's got a lot of uh, you know, a lot of laps around here and learn some stuff from these guys and just go to school for these first couple of laps. And he's put himself in a, a really great spot in the top 10. And he's just going to continue to learn. This track is really difficult to kind of figure out uh, your way around for somebody who's never been in here. There's not a track in the world like Daytona. So uh, for him, he's getting to go to school right now and figure this place out a little more. We're looking at the grandstand, uh, several thousand uh, fans uh, dotted around the circuit, quite a few of them uh, up in the grandstand now. But Roger, we're looking at these live pictures, we're looking out of our commentary box, the sun is breaking through here. Uh, now, uh, what a difference three and a half hours makes. Uh, we wouldn't have said this at 9.20 this morning when the downpour came. No, not at all. And also with, with the sun out like this, it's going to raise up the track temperature as well. And, you know, these guys have been on track either in the morning and a lot of overcast it's going to change the, the bike setup a little bit. The track temperature is a little bit higher. So these these guys have a lot changing as, as the race goes on and the, the tires go off and the track temperature rises. And you're going to have to try to adjust. Yeah, we did think at one point that we would be having a jet ski race in uh, the middle of the, uh, the lake here. But uh, thankfully, the sun is out and the Daytona 200 is currently uh, seven laps old. 50 laps to go when we do resume. There is our current leader. He will start from pole position when this race uh, gets back underway. If you are just joining us on Moto America Live Plus, we are under a red flag situation. Roger Hayden alongside me, Michael Hill, and uh, our uh, lead commentators for the Daytona 200, Greg White and Jason Pridmore, will be back once uh, we get uh, this race underway again. Hannah Loper and uh, Jamie Howe down there in pit lane. And uh, when we do have uh, some information down there, we will be able to hear from our uh, pit lane ladies who, uh, as ever, are doing a great job uh, running up and down uh, and certainly uh, grateful that they don't have to be under the umbrella. They can top up the tan uh, and watch the Daytona 200. Sounds like a perfect afternoon to me. Yeah, they do all the work for us while we get to sit up here and watch on a monitor. But uh, it's pretty hot out there now with the sun beaming. They got a lot of work to do and, uh, you know, they got to continue going up and down pit lane the, the whole race. So they're going to they're going to get their steps in today. Absolutely, and uh, I'm not sure, was that the same bike? Was that a, that had a green tank? Oh, it was the same bike. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll shut up then. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure no, that's the another, same bike? That is another one. one. So, was I right for the first time this weekend? Well, there's two in there. There's two bikes. 
Yeah, but we only saw one crash before, right? So what yeah. we're actually seeing, there was actually two riders uh, that, that went down. Unbelievable. Uh, Roger Hayden just said, I finally got something right. I tell you, you've made, you've made my year, mate. I don't care what happens for the rest of the season. Uh, so we actually had two riders that uh, went down. Uh, we haven't uh, seen who the second rider was, but uh, both machines uh, a little bit secondhand. Not sure, though, if they went down together or if, if one guy crashed somewhere else and I just picked them all up on the, on the same lap, but... Looks like their race is done. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the uh, the truck there bringing the bikes back. Uh, of course, we've said all weekend, and if you are new to Moto America, uh, it's a very interactive championship. We love you uh, getting involved with us. You can follow the championship, not just here at Daytona, which also sees the opening round of the Moto America Twins Cup Championship, the Super Hooligans that we saw yesterday, and the Mission Foods King of the Baggers, which we've already seen two fantastic races. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, the Moto America Superbike Championship gets underway alongside MotoGP at the Circuit of the Americas. And then a couple of weeks after that, the Moto America Championship proper gets underway uh, with all of the other supporting categories, including Super Sport, Junior Cup, and uh, all of the uh, Super Stock 1000, Stock 1000s as well, let's not forget that, uh, and the Superbike Cup as well. Uh, that's at Road Atlanta. From Road Atlanta, we go to Virginia, from Virginia to Road America, and then the season really does pick up pace, doesn't it, uh, Roger, as we uh, crisscross this uh, fantastic country, providing great racing on uh, both the East and the West Coast. Yeah, these guys are, you know, once the summer starts and get right in the middle of the season, they're going to get real busy, and that's why the off-season testing is, is so important for all these guys because once, once the season starts and you get in the, you know, the thick of the season, it's hard to do a lot of testing, and we're going to see who did their homework this off-season. Yeah, we heard from Richie Escalante earlier on in the show today. He was up here in the commentary box with us, and uh, he said limited laps of him. And now oh, there's the fans giving us a wave. Yeah, we see how you're doing down, down there, everybody. This is the part that I love about Moto America. Fans so enthusiastic up there uh, in the grandstands uh, as well. And, of course, you can get involved with us. Send in your messages at Moto America on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and on YouTube. MotoAmerica.com, the official championship website. And you can, of course, uh, get in touch with all of uh, your favorite riders, favorite teams, favorite sponsors as well. Uh, every single person uh, making Moto America uh, the fantastic championship that it is. Uh, coming back to Richie Escalante, Roger, he said that he is riding here on the, uh, the new next-gen super sport machine, but limited testing. He said he did about 20 laps, uh, and they were in very wet conditions uh, as well. So we talk about testing and how important testing is, but such has been the weather uh, over the last couple of uh, weeks and months building up to the start of the season. Uh, a lot of these guys haven't really done more than 50 laps. No, and I mean, for him, it's just impressive that he's as fast as he is right now, just because he, of the limited laps and coming from a completely different bike the Kawasaki now to the Suzuki's two different things and you know that's the thing about testing whenever you go sometimes it can rain and, and you don't get many laps and I think for him he's going to get stronger as this race goes on as he understands the bike more and gets more laps so you can see the various uh, machines just blowing away the debris and uh, we are just being told here by uh, producers in my ear that we've got four minutes until the pit lane uh, we'll open and we'll get racing again. They've done a great job there, Roger. We did, weren't under much of a delay at all. Uh, great work here at Daytona. And for the riders as well, you don't want to be sitting there too long. You want to get going again uh, to, to keep that momentum going. Yeah, once you get in that rhythm and then you stop, that's definitely for a rider. You want to kind of keep going, especially if you were feeling good. And let's just say that the bike was coming to you and you kind of better, your setup was better kind of toward the end of the into these last couple laps before pit stops, you definitely don't want to see a see a red flag unless you made a mistake and maybe wanted the, the group to bunch back up. But this is one of those things that it's part of racing. Uh, the red flags come out, and you just got to kind of stay calm, regroup. And if you got a good start, you won't want to do the same thing again. Yeah, we were just looking then at the orange machine of the number 53, uh, uh, August uh, Nord from Bloomington, uh, riding on the uh, August Racing YZFR6. And uh, there it is. That's a, that's a nice machine, that. I quite like that. It's got kind of like a Tiger vibe. Yeah. I quite like that. I've not seen that before, but uh, very good. Uh, again, just keeping up there, Roger, of the tire warmers, uh, you know, as we now see uh, Max uh, Angles just taking a, a drink there. wonder what's going through his mind. 
I'd say he's nervous. I mean, I'd say there's a lot going through his mind right now. Like I said, leading his first professional race. And not only that, Daytona 200 as well. And for him, he's going to get to learn a lot. You know, we talk about other guys learning the this track. He knows this track well, but he's getting a race against guys like Cam Peterson, Superbike winners, and, you know, Josh Hayes, Superbike champions, and going to get to learn so much with these guys that he hasn't got to – to race with before and it's only going to make him step up his riding as as he watches these guys and see what they do and not only that his confidence is going to be go, being pretty high once we hit road atlanta yeah and that was going to be my next point we saw yesterday uh, the confidence from young blake davis the winner in the twins cup race and uh, we've seen max angles in moto america uh, in recent years and he's had some some solid results but never quite that breakthrough race is this the, is this it is, as you said he gets a great result here he's leading his first race he's in front of all these uh, former champions Danny Eslick, four-time winner here. Now that is going to give him a massive confidence boost I think for the it season. Should, it should give him a lot of confidence leaving here, no matter what happens the rest of this race, just because this has been his best showing. If you can do it here at Daytona, you can do it anywhere. And uh, just whatever he, you know, whatever he worked on this offseason looks like it's really paying off. But the thing is, this race is really early. He needs to continue to, to be patient and not get rattled if he gets in a group. But even when he's leading, you know, it doesn't, he hasn't made a mistake yet, and uh, it's really hard to do when you're leading your first big race. We're looking at the number four, the squid hunter Yamaha of uh, Josh Hayes, Melissa Paris, his wife and crew chief, uh, in the background there as well. As you can see, the bike's getting ready to come back out. Does this change Josh's uh, strategy? Because in the first part, he said, I've got to be aggressive, I've got to get to the lead group. He's done that now. Now, now he's got to calm down. There's still 50 laps to go. I'd say he has a lot less anxiety now because when you're starting in the back, a lot of stuff can happen. You're going in that turn one, it's really tight. Uh, you know, you got 40 guys in front of you. Somebody can crash in front of you and, and take you out, or two guys can get together and you get caught up in the middle of it. There's a lot more risk when you start that far back. Now he knows he has the pace. He caught these guys in five laps, so he's probably a lot more relaxed. He has a lot of, he's got a lot of experience. He's going to know what, what he needs to do. But like I said, I just think now, He's probably a lot more relaxed. He's in the position that he wants to be in, and uh, he's right there. You can see the flag marshal at the end of the pit lane. There is uh, August Nord uh, getting back on the machine. In fact, all riders are now getting back on the machines. Tire warmers are coming off. The klaxon sounds, and the green flag is waved. The uh, riders now then have just 60 seconds to exit pit lane. Roger, if you're not out on track uh, before the uh, red flag, you will then have to start at the back of the grid. And uh, what happens now? Do they, get a, do they actually get another warm-up lap, or do they just grid up and then we race? I don't know it, the rules. Well, sometimes they change it. it you yeah, know, that's what I'm not sure of. If yeah. they're in a hurry or not. But, uh, you know, maybe Josh, maybe he wants to start in the back again. You know, <laughs> maybe. Try to, try to make it exciting. It worked for him. Uh, it worked for him the first time, didn't it? Uh, we got a brief glimpse there of the triple four of Harry Trulove and his brother Matt, uh, 196. Still in this race uh, for the uh, British fans that are watching. Uh, Matt uh, running in 19th, Harry running in 10th place. Of course, uh, Brandon Parsh, who was uh, racing for the PTR team last year, run by Simon Buckmaster. Uh, that team uh, in the British Championship last year ran Brandon and Kyle Smith on the Triumph 765. Uh, Kyle with a win, Brandon with a couple of uh, podiums. And that team will move into World Supersport. And how good is it with these new rules uh, in the World Supersport? We're going to see the return of Triumph and Ducati uh, in a World Championship. And how exciting is it for the fans here that at Daytona that the first time we see the new rules running, it's at the Daytona 200. And I think you said it right. It just brings a lot more brands. Look at the support that Ducati's coming to show that new V2 here at Daytona. And what a showing that they're having so far with Josh Heron on pole and also kind of been in that current group of the race but that's what you want to see you want to see a lot of different brands i mean we got a kawasaki yamaha trump ducati and suzuki all in the top eight so yeah. i mean that's just what you want to see yeah every single manufacturer represented inside the top eight and that bodes well not just for this race but also for the remainder of the uh, moto america season doesn't it uh, as we move to the different circuits for me it's going to be interesting to see when we go to the other kinds of circuits we go to atlanta we go to road america uh, when we get to brainerd for example very very different tracks it'll be interesting to see if there's a particular manufacturer that lends itself to a certain style of circuit i think some tracks some some bikes and some manufacturers are going to work better than others and i think that's just where every racetrack you go some people's bikes work better in different parts and you're just going to figure that out as you go and also you know if there's changes that moto america needs to make as the season goes on to if they need to even something out you know they can do that yeah absolutely uh, 
As the riders come down then into pit lane. If you are just joining us, this is the 3.56, 5.72 kilometer Daytona International Speedway. Pole position is on the rider's left. We are running in a counterclockwise direction. 12 turns, one of the fastest circuits, in fact, the fastest circuit that we will go to. Also, Roger, one of the longest as well. Road America, probably the second longest, but again, a very different kind of circuit. Yeah, this one is not like any other ones with the banking and the, and the drafting. And, you know, there's a lot of... A lot of tracks, if you're the best rider, sometimes you can break away. But here at Daytona, with, with the drafting and both bankings, it makes it really hard to, to break away. And strategy comes into play here at Daytona. Riders then gridding up. It's a quick start procedure here. Only one mechanic allowed on the grid. The riders uh, lining up now after the sighting lap. I believe that they will be uh, flagged off on... Uh, and we're missing somebody at the moment on the second row of the grid. Who are we missing there? That's Danny Eslick, who has not made it back to the grid as yet. We just see Max Angles taking his position. Roger standing up to look out of the window. Uh, we do not see Danny Eslick yet. Uh, let's just uh, wait a second till the camera moves, but we haven't seen him come around uh, to line up on the second row of the grid. And now oh, there he is, there he is. He was just uh, taking his time. Oh, it worried me for a second there. I was thinking uh, he left that a bit late. Uh, mind games have started already, Roger. Mind games have started already. Right there, we are going to have one warm-up lap. You can see the shadows now as well. Uh, it is a lot warmer, and that will also alter the track conditions uh, for these guys. Yeah, track temperature is definitely going to be a lot higher. And, uh, you know, what, what tire manufacturer? We don't know yet. Which one's going to work better in the, in the higher temperatures? And then also bike setup, grip. There's a lot of stuff that can change with the higher temperatures. Yeah, we can see uh, Max Angles... Uh, there on the Kawasaki, so it's Kawasaki Yamaha, Yamaha on the front row of the grid, Triumph, Ducati Triumph on row number two, a pair of Suzuki's and a Yamaha on row number three as the riders head off on this warmer lap. We are here at the Daytona International Speedway, seven laps were completed, we had a red flag situation, we can report that both riders are okay, there are 50 laps to go. And as the riders make their way around this warm-up lap, myself, Michael Hill, and Roger Hayden, we're going to take a back seat as we head back to our lead commentary team of Greg White and Jason Pridmore. All right, welcome back to the Daytona 200, the 80th edition. And the red flag situation has been cleaned up. Motorcycles are on their warm-up lap. Let's take a look at the new grid because they've completed seven laps of the 57 of this race and Max Angle's going to be on pole and this restart with Cameron Peterson and all that work Josh Hayes did, Danny Eslick, Josh Heron and Brandon Posh. So there's a look at those first two rows and Jason Pridmore. Let's take a look at how Josh Hayes was able to get himself from last row onto the front row for the restart of this race. Yeah, you're going to get a look there right in the middle of your screen. Got that little bit of yellow on the bike. He's going to go past a number of guys off into turn one. And I know Josh, this is pretty cautious, aggressive, if you know what I mean. He gets way out wide there. This is a second horseshoe. And you can see this is later in the race, Greg, because I can see he's already gone through. There's lock off. So this is going to be somewhat later in the race as he splits Eslick and Josh Heron on the banking. And I'm sure these guys were thinking, man, he got up here awful quick. Seven laps into this race, he's gone from the back of the back grid all the way through these guys. So cemented his place, has himself in third. Now, the other key interesting thing about this, Greg, you don't want to see a lot of red flags because that's just more starts and more time on these clutches. Saw a couple guys with a couple aggressive starts just even on their their warm-up lap here. And uh, you want to try to take care of this bike. This is, the again, a big difference between what we normally see in just normal everyday sprint races. Uh, we got to try to maintain the best we can underneath us. And of course, now the sun is shining here in Daytona Beach, Florida, but that's because a cold front is pushing through. And even though it is 346 local time, the temperature is starting to plummet even with the sun out. So 62 degrees now. And by the time this race ends, it could be as cold as 59 or 58 degrees. Very interesting conditions. That'll make an interesting spot for when we get into that second pit stop with a, you know, with the second set of tires, especially if the track temperature keeps dwindling down as the as the outside air temperature does the same. So a couple guys I think are happy to see that it was probably Sheridan Marias. He had come, he had time to come in, talk to his crew about whatever the problem was. So we're getting ready, 50 laps to go in this one as it's already credited with seven laps. Max Angles, 
Number 64 out of Miami, Florida, sits in the top spot, the closest to turn number one. And then it's Cameron Peterson, the 45, the South African who now lives in Corona, California, on that attack performance Yamaha. And old number four, Josh Hayes, on that Squid Hunter, Yamaha YZF R6. So the final motorcycles are getting into their spots. We know we have uh, one rider that's coming down on the left part of your screen. Just out of, you can see right on the right part of your screen, this rider not able to make this restart, trying to get off the grid, and there's a break in the wall down there. So once that rider clears, He's not going to be able to clear there. Oh, I think, he's, so. uh, I think maybe, perhaps, yeah, the 520. So it looks like the 520 is going to get out of the way. Perhaps start the race. All right, here we go. Start number two, 50 laps remaining. And away we go. Max Angle's got a good launch. So did Cameron Peterson. The guy who didn't oh, get a good start, that's Danny Eslick there. And that's probably, I don't know what's going on with Danny. Something weird is going on with that motorcycle. The guy who didn't get a start was the guy in the front row. Josh Hayes got shuffled back pretty quickly. Finds himself in fourth on the exit of turn one, but his launch initially wasn't that good. Heron from the second row gets himself in there. You can see Posh there in fifth. And there's Danny Eslick. All right, so Danny Eslick back up and running, but his hand was in the air. That's a scary moment for Danny Eslick because all those riders were coming through the field. So Eslick trying to, oh, you can see how He's far back he is. But people. Max Angles continues to lead the way. The 64, Cameron Peterson having a look over his shoulder. And there is Josh Heron, the number two, and Hayes has worked his way up into fourth. So now into the banking we go. Angles and Cam Peterson before the red flag. It started to break away a little bit. Heron continues to have problems under acceleration with the Ducati fighting traction. But this is the way Josh Heron likes the Ducati. He likes it a little bit loose. He says he can feel the bike better when it's rolling around like that. And that Kawasaki looks awfully fast. So coming off of this red flag, Let's go ahead and get to Jamie Howe, who's got a report on what happened during the red flag conditions. Jamie? Well, I was standing with Max Angles when the word came down that he was going to get to lead this field back to green. One of the things that he said was he was not going to waste this opportunity. He started the race initially from the eighth position, was able to move up into the top five after the first lap, and then use that draft to be able to move up into the lead where he finds himself now. He doesn't have that advantage leading the race right now, so he said he's got to keep his head down. He's got to be smart. He was able to debrief with the team. They changed their strategy a little bit in terms of what tires they want to go with and how they're going to let the rest of this race unfold. We have a lot to go, Hannah. Well, as far as Danny Eslick's concerned, you know, we saw him motioning out there on the track during the first start of this race. I spoke with his crew chief, Al Ludington. I asked why he was motioning if there was a problem. He said they had a little glitch. They tr quickly troubleshot the issue, and they could see it in the data. They believed that they were able to correct it and hoped that it would no longer be an issue. But obviously, the restart of that race, we saw Danny once again having trouble. So if I hear any more updates, we'll get back to you with those. All right, I thanks, Hannah. All right, so big lead changes going on as Josh Heron takes over. Cameron Peterson, you can see going to the left-hander, sending the bike sideways. Yeah, he did that pretty heavy going down into the International Horseshoe, and the problem with that is it just wears things out. And, uh, uh, you know, this is Cam's first run here at Daytona, and he's, he's, he's learning by fire right now. This is what he's doing. And got to give a shout-out to that guy. Just moved into six, gets, gets passed back, but... Again, Harry Trulove doing an amazing job from England. First time here running with the TSC team, a group out of Wisconsin that have done a tremendous job putting two bikes under two brothers this weekend. Both guys are riding really, really well. Matt's back in 16th at the moment. Harry had a really good first run those first seven laps and had the same pace as the leaders. He's finding himself now in this fight. As you can see, he runs a little bit wide going into the chicane. That's going to allow Escalante yep. to go back underneath him as Angles leads him out again. Heron, Hayes, and Peterson follow in tow. Max Angles looks so comfortable. Just looks this, solid. It's a huge opportunity, not only just because he's getting his name out there, but because he's getting all this experience leading this tremendously talented field. And the amount of race winners in the Daytona 200 that have won this race before, 
There's a ton of them. As you see, number two, that's Josh Heron on that Warhorse Racing HSBK. Here comes Josh Hayes up the inside. He's going to go low. Is Hayes going to have an opportunity to lead this race? He's going to go hard on the brakes. Here goes Hayes into turn number one, and he'll take oh. over lead, and Heron pushes Angles out of the way. Yep, and that's okay, though. Angles should be able to get himself back in line here, hopefully, and get right where he needs to be. Those guys aren't going to get too far away. Heron just got it a little bit deep. Hayes went up underneath. Hayes had an amazing run through the tri-oval to squeeze up underneath Angles, and then Heron probably got just sucked into that draft as well, ever so slightly, because he shared in Mariah's there also, just back there in about seventh or eighth place, it looks like. So Josh Hayes from last to first in the matter of eight laps, nine laps. Yeah, he's right where he needs to be now. We know this guy loves to lead races. He doesn't like to follow. He doesn't like to uh, be behind anybody. He likes to lead the race. And you heard him, Greg, all weekend long. He's been fast all weekend long. He's been able to have the pace on that number four, R6. And now he's got a dance partner with Cam Peterson, two Yamaha R6s, kind of pulling away ever so slightly from those guys in third. They'll be able to still suck up into the draft of these other two guys in front of them, but they're going to start to spread the field out ever so slightly. Here's a look, Jason, on left part of your screen, what happened to the 64? Well, you can see Heron just doesn't quite have the, the comfort to just tip that bike in and turn it. And then Angles is just to the outside of him. So he was just kind of stuck out to dry ever so slightly there, pushes him wide. He's already back in that lead group, that lead draft. Nobody's going to really go anywhere as far as Angles is concerned, as I can see out from our commentary spot. He's got underneath two guys in the turn four banking out the draft. You can see these guys all coming to the line. Now Escalante wants a shot at leading the Daytona 200 as he comes across the line right behind Camp Peterson. So here comes Richie Escalante. He'll take over the spot. So there goes the vision wheel in for XR Suzuki rider. And just like that, he loses it. And there goes Camp Peterson. So it's Cameron Peterson, 45, Richie Escalante, 54, Josh Heron, number two, Josh Hayes, number four. Much more tidy from Cam Peterson in front there going into the International Horse Show. You saw that bike directly in line. So the lap before, when he had the thing backed in there, he'd obviously just gotten in there a little bit too fast. And uh, we know how good he is. He's got a big opportunity this year with this attack performance team, both here at Daytona on this R6. And then we will see him later in the year on that championship winning R1 that Jake Gagne rode to championship last year. So Cam doing a nice job. And here comes Sheridan Marias, who obviously had a problem. Uh, the opening lap of the original start ran wide in this very corner. But Marias has now clawed his way into the top five, up behind Hayes and Heron as they head down the back straightaway now. And Angles, just off the back of these three, should be able to get in the, the draft of these three in front of him and, and get drawn back up to that leader, into the leaders. Josh Hayes side by side with Josh Heron. So Hayes trying to get it stopped through the chicane, a wider line than he normally takes. He was in there a bit deep, wasn't he? You could definitely tell Josh was in there just a little bit deep, and that compromised his exit as well. As you can see, Heron runs up along the outside of Hayes as he comes out of there. Josh's mid-corner through the chicane just wasn't quite as good, and look who's coming back. The number 64, Max Angles, down on the bottom. He's going to get a five-rider draft. Don't be surprised if this guy might lead him across the trioval. Here they go. Oh, almost touching is Josh Hayes and oh. Sheridan Marias. That's dangerous times on the banking. But the two experienced riders hold on to it, and it'll be Heron into turn one. And that closed off angles from being able to go down the inside of all those guys as he came across. But now he can catch his breath. He's back in that lead group. Brandon Posh also on the TOBC. Triumph is doing a really nice job of putting himself where he needs to be. Marias goes up underneath Peterson, as well as Escalante going up underneath Hayes in the International Horseshoe. We have about a six-rider breakaway now, Greg. The next rider back there, I believe, is True Love with Lockoff just behind. For Sheridan Marias, this has been a dream come true to be able to participate in the Daytona 200. He actually came over back in 2020 with the same team, this exact same bike. They went through the qualifying sessions. That was when COVID shut the actual running of the race down. And then in 2021, he couldn't get back into the United States due to all the travel restrictions. The bike has actually been based up in Atlanta through a friend of the team. It's been in storage. But all of the team based in Germany, they came over this year with one goal, and that was to get out there, actually turn some race laps. The, the 
performance that they have found through practice and qualifying uh, has certainly been something that they've been looking for and enjoying every single moment of this, Hannah. Yeah, it's paying off as Marias is in the lead for a moment anyway. Sorry about that, Jamie. And uh, Marias goes into the lead for a moment, and all of a sudden, just like that, heading into the chicane, he gets shuffled back to third, and so then it's Heron taking over on the run to the checkered flag. Or the start finish line. Checkered flag is still 45 <laughs> laps away. Yeah, and we have a couple sure. pit stops to go, which really begs the question, Jason, what are teams going to do after competing seven laps? They, they went into the pits. They weren't allowed to change tires, but they were allowed to refuel the bike. So now pit stop strategy. Normally we see on lap 19, it's going to be interesting to see what these riders do as a Suzuki goes to the front. So just like that, it's Yamaha, Suzuki, Marias in third, a Ducati in the mix. There's still a Triumph that's in tow, as and, well as a Kawasaki. And just so you know, Danny Essek just runs the fastest lap of the race here at a, at a minute 50.4. He's off the back right now in 12th, but he's got this lead group as True Love has now closed up onto the back of these guys in the infield, and he's trying to bring a few other guys with him. Jeff May, Sam Lockoff, Hayden Gillum, and Danny Essek are all in that top 12, and we could see a lead draft of a full 12 bikes here within a couple of laps. So there goes the 54 of Richie Escalante. Tons of experience leading races. Let's get down to Hannah. Hannah, what you got? Well, you guys mentioned Harry Trula. And this is his first time ever at Daytona 200. In order to prepare, he watched plenty of footage, but he said nothing can really prepare you for the feeling of being sucked into the banking. You know, he's familiar with endurance racing and comfortable to go the distance, but he felt much more confident this morning. His overall expectation is to shoot for a top eight finish. It is a long race, but he is off to a fantastic start. Yeah, he's doing an amazing job here, Hannah, and he's got a very experienced team and crew down there with the TSC guys. And so that when you look at what he has had to deal with, he's come to Daytona, and, and if you have that experienced crew and team that can give you some data, give you some idea of what you can expect when you're out there, I would think that he's probably never been in an eight-bike draft for this long before, so that's going to be some taking uh, time to get used to. But uh, you can see here, even with the limited track time we have, a lot of talent from that young man, and he's uh, doing a nice job and I would suspect that top eight is more than doable at this point for him as we continue to watch this front group battle back and forth and the lead changes again as Dan, uh, Richie Escalante is now going to be shuffled back to fourth place with Josh Heron taking point Marias in second Cameron Peterson in fourth in third place Josh Hayes in fifth Want to take note that Danny Essek had a problem after the restart. He set the fastest lap of the race back in 11th at a 50.4. So Essek trying to bridge the gap to Sam Lockoff and Jeff May and get on the back of this lead group. You know, it's funny. We sit here and we're calling this race in the sense of who's where, but it changes so quickly, Greg, because as soon as these guys get, you know, I think everybody wants to take a shot at leading in the infield. As a rider, you start thinking to yourself, I know I can just get away if I can get through turn one by myself, but it just doesn't work that way. And you can see now there is a distinct breakaway. And I'm not exactly sure what has happened to that next group because they were right there. But all it takes is one little mistake from somebody to break that group up. And now you can see it looks like true of May, Lockoff, and Essek have just lost touch with this group up in front. Lap times right now, everybody in the front, well, the front 11, 12, are all in the 51s or better. So this lap, we're going to look and see who out of that second group runs a little bit slower lap, and that's probably going to be the reason why you see this breakaway. Good lead group, Josh Heron. Still coming to grips with that Ducati. It definitely makes its way around Daytona International Speedway in a different way than some of these inline fours or even the Triumph does. Danny Eslick back at 11. Again, fastest lap at a 150.4. As we're now coming to the line, they're gonna fan across. And Josh Hayes just chilling back there as they go seven wide into turn number one. Who's got the real estate? Up the inside goes Heron. A nice tidier line for Josh Heron that time, Jason. Looked like the Ducati was able to bite on the front and really carve that corner. So it's Heron Warhorse, HSBK Racing, Ducati, New York. And there goes Cameron Peterson. 
The thing with Cam Peterson is, is that he is able to take really tight lines and that Yamaha looks like it's turning really well. And Jason, the question becomes, what's the pit stop strategy and how long are those tires going to last when he's putting all that extra load on those tires, taking those tight turns? Well, this is another good thing is, as far as a rider goes, all these guys have experience. They're all going to be looking to see how each other ride. They're all going to be looking to see who's getting a little bit more loose than others, let's just say. Uh, they're all going to be able to kind of uh, get an idea of each other's tire wear. And this is what I'm really liking right now from a couple of the guys that you can see that haven't really spent tons of time up front. Um, I think Marias has been fairly uh, patient with this whole thing. But when you get in the draft, like these guys are now, it's kind of hard almost not to pass. But uh, this, this is a very intelligent group of riders that you have up at the front, and they're still in the feel-out period. We still have a long way to go in this race. So it's just a matter of being able to take in all the knowledge that you're seeing in front of you right now, and that can question when you're going to be coming into the pits. Right at the front is Josh Heron, and you mentioned him still coming to grips with this Ducati. And you mentioned it's different than some of the other bikes that are out there on the track. But remember, Josh is also coming out of super bikes for several seasons. So he's had to get used to the differences um, himself. And he, he said one of the biggest ones is with this bike, you just have to roll more speed through the corner. You're not as aggressive on the braking. And he came here and he tested at Daytona um, just a few weeks ago on this Ducati bike. So but he was more comfortable by the time they got there. He said it made all the difference in the world. He was able to lead the practice sessions, the qualifying sessions, obviously was our pole sitter coming in, but he said he's certainly getting there and he doesn't he doesn't want to let the team down today. Yeah, that bike moves around a lot. And we know we know Josh likes to have a bike that, that is a bit loose underneath him, and it definitely is. I'll tell you another guy who thinks just doing a great job. We haven't even mentioned him hardly. Brandon Posh, just sitting there. He's not in any hurry, Greg, to do anything crazy. And look, his teammate now, and you I'm not sure what's going on, but Essex gesturing over to that, uh, his pit boards again, but he has slowly just continued to close this gap in front, and uh, Brandon Posh is the next guy he's going to see, so he is going to have a teammate in this now, but Danny Essick, what a job he has done. To, it's taken him a lot longer to get up to the front than it did Hayes earlier, and that was because he got closed out and had a big problem in turn one. As you get a look at Sam Lockoff, Lockoff's another guy that's just going to continue to put these laps in. He's only a tick off the back of these guys right now. So the lead group is now formed up to eight riders. Last time by the stripe, it was Josh Heron who got credited with that lap. And he's starting to really settle into a rhythm, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not sure if I gave Harry Trulove the announcer's curse, but the second I talked about him, kind of started to go back, and he's in 12th now, and he's way off the back end of these guys. For a guy that's been running uh, in the 50s and 51s, he did a 53-1 the last lap, and I'm sure the lap before that was something similar, so I'm not sure if he's got a problem. We'll try to keep an eye on the 444 to see if there is a problem, but he was actually closing on these guys at one time, and now he's behind. That, that next three guys that were with him at behind him at one spot. On the banking, these riders trying to find position. And now into turn number one on the brakes, and Heron continues to lead the way. 113 is Sheridan Marias. 45 on that white and red Yamaha R6 is Cameron Peterson. And right behind him is the number 54 of Richie Escalante. 50 flat for Danny Eslick, fastest lap of the race again. Wow. So he is coming and so is this guy. Sam Lockoff does his personal best lap of the race, a 51 flat. And this is a young man that came from our Junior Cup program, jumped on with that M4 team last year, won a race, did a tremendous job learning, very few mistakes out of him, rides super intelligently, and he's got this lead group just sitting in front of him, and he knows when he goes to pit lane, he's got one of the most experienced teams in that M4 team when it comes to pit stops, multiple endurance championships from those guys in the Weir National Championship Series from years ago, but they know how to get a rider in and out of the box, and if Lockoff could just kind of get that last little bit out of himself to get up to these what is it Greg lead eight eight, eight riders yeah eight riders in front of him uh, he'll be in a nice position as he sees his teammate is up there also right now something to note is the amount of laps that we have done so they are work they have nine laps completed plus the seven from the original as the 113 goes to the lead. So Sheridan Marias takes over the spot. That leaves the door open as he roughed up Heron. So Cameron Peterson in second spot. 
But Jay, when they come across the line, it's going to be 17 laps on the tires. There's plenty of fuel because they got to stop after seven laps and refuel, but no tire changes allowed. Now riders fanning all over this banking as Marias aggressively comes down the banking. Other riders have to be mindful of that. So here we go. There's seven in our picture. And another rider just off the back. So now, and now Danny's up in that group. He is. So, and I, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching Hayes. I'm watching Posh. I'm watching these guys at the back and they are legitimately, looks like they're almost letting off. They don't have anywhere to really go when they come across the trioval. But those three guys have been consistently, I know Essex just joined the party here, but, but Hayes and Posh for sure have been the two most patient. They've just been kind of sitting back there. Both have had their turns at the front. We saw Posh lead the opening lap of this race. Posh had to look over his shoulder there and sees that he doesn't have any pressure coming in from behind him. Now, a couple things to note here. Heron's using a lot of track out of the kink. His bike's moving a lot, a, a lot out of here. Last lap out of here, you can see the bike moving around like it is now, and it's causing him to stand the bike up early and run out over that curbing. And that's why a couple of these guys have been able to turn it up underneath them. We saw Cam do that a lap ago in the chicane, and, and Heron's bike looks extremely loose right now. So that could be our first sign of one of the leaders having a tiny bit of tire wear, Greg. Working lap 11. Tire battle still going on. We have riders up in the mix that are on Pirelli's and Dunlop tires. You see Cameron Peterson trying to go up the inside. He'll take over second spot. So Josh Heron on that Ducati on Dunlop tires. The attack performance team with Cameron Peterson on Pirelli's. And Pirelli, the winner here at Daytona 200 the last couple of years. Dunlop trying to regain that. In terms of the riders in this group, there are definitely more Dunlops than Pirelli's in this lead eight at the moment. Angles has a really nice draft here on everybody. He's gonna come across. Looks like uh, everybody kind of got back in behind him there. See, this is one of those races where you see those gaps form, but it's the draft that usually just bunches everybody back up. It takes a big mistake coming onto a banking or even through the infield to get a gap. The question is, who's got the urgency? Who wants to set the pace? Who wants to have the clean air? Like I said before, the temperature is dropping. It's somewhere now around 60 degrees, but the sun is out. So we don't expect anything crazy like in a draft, like you hear at say MotoGP, where riders need clean air to keep their motorcycles cool. Not a factor with these middleweight sport bikes. I saw Heron gesture his team that time as he went through that area, Greg, and you can see how much twitchy, how twitchy the bike is. Even when he goes and grabs the brake lever, that bike is moving around a lot more than the other bikes underneath him at the moment. No, Josh trying to be as smooth as he can, but over some of these bumps and stuff, you can see that thing twitching, and I did see him, I thought I did see him make a gesture to his crew over there in the infield, so we'll keep an eye out. I don't think we're in, we're not in any real window right now as far as fuel goes to bring them in, but this would be, you know, we're on lap 12 here. It seems like we've got a lot more laps. These guys just keep going back and forth. Yeah, so working lap, we have 11 in the book, so these tires have 18 laps on them. Yeah. But most of the people telling me that with the, this tire battle going on, that the teams have done such development over the last couple of years. Dunlop and oh, and up and out of the saddle just for a moment just is a Cameron moment. Peterson. But yep. these tire manufacturers done done such a great job with these tires that they can go a lot longer than the pit stops allow. Where in years past, Jason, it wasn't the case. There were a lot of riders on lap 19 that were begging to come in to get new rubber on them. Now it doesn't seem to be much of a bother at all. And Jason, as we continue to look at what's going on at the racetrack, on the racetrack itself as Josh Herring takes over the lead where we also have a bird's eye view of pit lane to see when activity is going to start and when we think people are going to start coming in for pit stops. Yeah, and not only that, Greg, as these guys bend off into turn one, I'll tell you one of the nice things this year for the 200, in the past few years, we've seen so many riders out on the track, 60 riders plus sometimes, and the speed discrepancies have been so much that we're seeing people getting lapped after three laps, packs of people getting lapped after three laps. As one of our leaders is in, I'm looking up from above, it looks like Lockoff has come down pit lane and is making a pit stop, and uh, we'll check that, but I don't see him behind this lead group right now, so Lockoff off. Looks like he's in getting changed, but one of the good things this year is we only had 43 entrants or 43 riders that, that qualified by speed in the field. So 
our race at the front has been a lot more fun to watch because we haven't had big packs of guys that are eight, nine seconds off the pace. There are some lap riders now finally coming into play just up the road from this lead group that you see coming up onto the banking. There are some back markers probably about six to probably five, six seconds in front of them. And unfortunately for Lockoff, who's in the pits, they're having a real problem. He is losing all kinds of time. It's that front tire they're not able to get on on the left part of your screen as we continue to see this battle up front. Now we're getting into oh, some lap traffic. Man, this is just what's so brutal about this race. Lockoff has done nothing wrong. He's ran a perfect race. And to have a front wheel get jammed and not be able to get it in there, that's a bummer for Lockoff. The leaders now are out of the chicane. He's going to lose a lap. These guys are going to be drafting past a group of a about six riders, Greg, and in that group, and I'm not sure if he had a problem. Obviously, he had a problem. I did see Rocco Landers just up the ray from this group, so he has had a problem during the race. Oh, a couple, so big incident wow. there as it looked like Richie Escalante was trying to make his way into pit lane, and Josh Hayes was in the way, so Hayes had to take evasive action. So it looked like it was Escalante. Jason, I just caught it out of the corner yep. of my eye. Now, all of a sudden, we're into this melee of lap traffic. There are riders everywhere. And the other problem that you have right now is is there's a bike of Sam Lockoff sitting there. They couldn't get Lockoff's bike sorted. So Escalante missed this thing. His crew were not ready for him. This is a disaster for the M4 team right now. As you can see, I, I, nobody was ready for him, Greg. There's no rear stand under the bike. Everybody didn't even know that he was coming in the pits. They're finally now getting to him. So the team with the most experience that I would have thought would have got these guys in and out really quickly, they are just running into big trouble. Oh, unfortunately for that Vision Wheel M4 X-Star Suzuki team losing all kinds of time. It looks like the bike sits there for lock-off, but they've got Richie Escalante out. Now, what happens after this is a big question, but so much action going on on the track, and we were wondering when these riders were going to come in. And there's Rocco Landers right there. So we know this young man's capable of running up in this lead group, but he's had a problem earlier on, Greg. That's why you see Cam Peterson and this other, all the group behind. And you can see how separated we get when we get into some back markers here. You can see Heron there is still second. Marias has gone through in third. Now Marias is going to be used to an abundance of back markers coming from the World Endurance Championship. He's used to passing people a day and night. So we're going to keep an eye out. We're kind of the eye is in the sky over here. We can see when these guys start peeling off and coming towards pit lane. We'll be looking for arms and legs going out. But you can see we have a little bit of separation now, don't we? Yeah, we certainly do. And this is what we expect to see this time of the race. So Cameron Peterson continues to lead the way. There's still a whole heap of laps left in the Daytona 200 as we prepare for most of these riders to start coming in for pit stops real soon. So Cameron Peterson out front, Josh Heron on that Ducati, number two in second place. Sheridan Mariah is still in the mix. We got a triumph right there as well. And Jason, this is world stage stuff. I mentioned at the top of the show, the uh, FIM is here looking at- looking over? They're all looking at their pit boards. Didn't mean to interrupt you, Greg, but they're all looking at their pit boards. Yeah, they certainly are. And why, Jason? Because it's pit stop time. The windows are open. Who's going to come in and who's ready for them? The one thing with the attack performance team of Cameron Peterson is that they only have now, Jason, one rider. So they know and they're going to be ready and totally focused because Gagne, who tried to start this race, who crashed earlier, was out of it. And we know that from our position that Sam Lockoff has gotten back out onto the racetrack. So he's going to be a lap or two down, but still needs to get that experience. Hayden Gillum has also come in, Greg. You can see on our on our tree there on the left, he's in and out of the pits. But all these guys were looking at pit boards. And you know the thing is, Greg, is you can get information from other people's pit boards by looking at their boards as well. So you know who may or may not be coming in. So if you're in a window or you think that you might want to have a guy or you've got an agreement with somebody that they're going to be coming in around the same time, that is something that can also be put into place. So let's see. Right now we are traffic-free coming out of the chicane. Let's see if any of these guys start to signal that they will be coming down pit lane. Down to the bottom goes Cameron Peterson. 45-113, Marias. He'll get passed by Josh Heron. And there's Danny Eslick right there in the mix, who after a disastrous restart is comfortably in that position. And then this other group 
Again, these pit stops are going to be so important because the time that you can lose or make up in the pits by your team's performance, and most of these teams not doing any pit stops most of the time during the year, so it's something new to them. We've had a pit stop challenge earlier in the weekend. And that was won by Josh Heron's Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York team. And one huge advantage for that team is that single-sided swing arm on that Ducati. Around lap traffic they go. Cameron Peterson Th got a nice little bit of a run. Here, Jason, Jason, how important is it? Oh, as Heron gets bogged a little bit. But look, these riders are out there running their own race here at Daytona. But how important is it for a guy like Cameron Peterson to try to make a break through the infield, try to get away, and then dip into pit lane? Oh, man, I'll tell you, it's huge. And this right now is the biggest lead we've seen in the race. Cam Peterson has had a tremendous run through the little bit of traffic that we just saw there in the infield to separate himself. Now, these guys will be a little bit far back. Also, Posh, Hayes, and Angles had lost that lead group through the last bit of back markers that we had gone through. They clawed their way back into it. But you can see this big group of five guys now close back in on Cam Peterson as he dips into the chicane and he's in and he's out but these guys in front have kind of closed back up it's so crazy how, Greg I can't explain it. I know you've had it, the, the experience a little bit yourself you come off these bankings and you could be so far behind somebody but you can kind of start to feel yourself slowly get drawn up into their draft now they're on the, the far bank and as they come down towards us here at the tri-oval and it looks like we've got some guys coming in Camp Peterson's on his way in Sheridan Marias is on his way in and it looks like is it uh is it angles also all three of these guys are going to come down pit lane and we're going to see what their crews can do Cameron Peterson all the way down in pit stall number one as he's got the rev limiter so it's a 60 kilometer about 37 mile an hour speed limit and of course the attack team choosing stall number one they feel it gives them the biggest advantage let's listen to this pit stop this year there's a change to the rules they are allowed to work on the tires and refuel at the same time rear tires going in looks like richard's having a little trouble with the fender mount trying to get that front tire in there soundly rear axle is in still struggling just a little bit with that front tire and it looks like he is on his way back out very quick pit stop from attack performance yeah but an even quicker one hannah from sheridan marias and you'd expect that that team down there that's getting Marias in and out of the paddock make a living at the FIM World Endurance Championship, and they got Marias in and out, and he is going to have a small gap over Peterson, one which Cam is going to be able to run down. Now, those two guys separated themselves a lot from Max Angles. Max Angles' pit stop was quite a bit slower. The outlap here is so key, isn't it, Greg? we got to get out there and get up to speed as quickly as we can while still being careful. Now, these four guys, there's there's Eslick going over that inside curbing again these guys the stage has been set Marias and the attack team have got their riders out fairly quickly when these four start ducking down into the pits and you'd expect with the single-sided swing arm of that Ducati they should be able to get Heron in and out pretty quickly by Josh Hayes going down as low as he is right now I expect him to come in and there he goes he ducks down in there now it's going to be Heron and the two TOBC bikes coming across the line so Josh Hayes in the pits and out continues continually circulating the racetrack is Josh Heron, Danny Eslick. And so the question is for the TOBC Triumph team, what their strategy is. Do they need one rider at a time to keep their pit area nice and, and open, or will both these riders come in at the same time? Well, they got a pretty big team, and I'm suspecting that they're going to probably, if they do come in, they can come in at the same time because there's Josh Hayes going in. But that way, Posh and Heron can go both work together to get back up to the front if they have lost any time, providing their team gets them out at the same exact time. Now, he's probably going to come out just behind them as they exit the horseshoe now these guys are down into turn one at the moment the leaders Heron Posh and Eslick are on the turn two banking right now headed down the back straight and Danny Eslick has a nice little look over his shoulder at Josh Heron
Jason. He said he and his team didn't plan on changing tires. It was just a fuel stop and go. Danny Eslick now drafts by the Ducati of Josh Herring to take over the point for the moment, but Herring's got position on the inside into turn number one, and another lap for these three. And as they continue to put, push this pit strategy down the racetrack, if they can continue to do this, these riders are going to have the freshest tires towards the end of the race. Well, what we got to think about now is how much of a disadvantage are they going to be at? There's three Yamahas riding together. Hayes got out with Marias and Camp here. They are in the mid-51s now, where we know this is about where the race has been. And you can see that Josh Heron gave a signal to his person holding up his pit board. Yeah, that he got the signal. Danny Eslick did the same thing, thumbs up. And Josh Heron continues to wave like, hey, just let you know, I'm coming in. And that's really smart on Heron's part to let these guys around him know, hey, you guys, I'm definitely coming in this next lap. So if you're up behind me, and that Ducati needs a tire badly right now. Heron's done a really nice job holding on to this bike. But he's letting these guys know, if you come out behind me out of the chicane, uh, I'm going to be ducking into pit lane. And let's see if these TOBC Triumphs are thinking about doing the same thing. These one-off race triumphs, not doing the Moto America season for the TOBC team, but just doing the Daytona 200 into the chicane they go. You can see Heron's more pacing himself at this point. Or he's having a problem and wow. starting to slow down. Maybe that, that tire is really, really shot. As Heron, I can see him on the exit of the chicane. He has come to almost a stop. Is he out of gas, Greg? It looks like the Ducati might be out of gas as he comes out of the chicane. Big problems right now. Boy, that is a long way around the banking. Can he milk this bike? If he starts moving it back and forth, Jason, we know it could be gas. But it is looking like it is over for Josh Heron and the Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York team. Did they give him a pit board too late? Yep. Now yep, to the they pit. Did. Yeah, here, here comes Brandon Posh, last year's winner. Pit lane speed limiter on. Now that all the leaders are in, most of them anyway. We're going to see who's going to be out front. It almost looks like Heron's got the thing running again, Greg. You can see him coming down through. He's on the bottom part of the banking. So we're going to have a look. Now the TOBC crew getting their work done. These guys have won the Daytona 200, and they've got the guy that won it last year, Greg, ready to hop back on. Let's get a good solid pit stop, and it looks like they have. Brandon Posh is ready to go. Awesome job by the TOBC crew. Jeff May also in the pits. You saw just in front, Jeff May had come into the pits as well. M4 was waiting for him, and here's Heron. He's at the top of pit lane, Greg, and he's got a long way to go to get down to the end of it, but he is out of gas. Yeah, that's what it looks like, and that's why he's in a full tuck. Now we're going to see where everybody sorts themselves out once we come back up here. So heartbreak before the first, first pit stop. It is such a bummer because if it was just a fuel calculation, that is a heartbreaker. So here comes Josh Heron. He's not out of the race. Jamie? No, and he hit his mark dead on. You talked about that single side swing arm that speeds up their pit stops. They also have this front jack, uh, this front stand that is from Endurance Racing over in Europe. That's also going to help them out. They're not addressing anything other than fuel and tires at this moment. So it seems to me like the fuel was, was the likely culprit of missing pit lane. Josh shaking his head still, unable to get that bike fired up. They're pushing him. He's trying to crank it, but he is not he's not left under power yet, Greg. Oh, and this is devastating because if he could have just got out, you never know if a red flag or something comes out. To stay on that lead lap is so important. And this thing is not starting, Greg. So they've got a big problem here with the Ducati right now on pit lane. Wow, and this is heartbreak for the number two of this team and Josh Aaron oh, such a bands. He's just trying to get that thing fired up. And there goes Danny Eslick. He's coming down pit lane as Danny Eslick. And it looks like he's got a problem also. It looks like he might be out of gas also, Greg, as he's coasting. And he's got a bit of a ways down to his crew as well. Danny Eslick runs out of gas. So some of these teams pushing know, the Jay. brakes to the limits. He, he's also pushing buttons, is Danny. Uh, he's got a problem. He's trying to restart it and, and start it back up and get it going. And he's, it's because it's stalled. Okay, it's stalled. So he's trying to get the bike restarted in gear to get him to push forward. So that's the problem you're seeing. And he's gonna get the bike in there. But again, you've gotta stay calm. You've gotta be able to understand it. Get as much fuel on this bike as you can right now because if a red flag comes out, could, could get you back into Hannah. But Danny's looking a little bit frustrated. They are refueling. They've got that rear, rear tire back in, front tire. They're having a little bit of trouble with it. Looks like they're gonna switch it. Trying to get another front tire in there. Looks like the axle's going back in. Danny's back on the 
bike, despite all the frustrations, you know he's a very versatile rider. He's able to adapt to any situation and he's on his way. Critical move by the crew to pump those front brakes, Jason. That's really critical. That's why Jake Gagne is in this race because he forgot to pump the front brakes in practice when he went ripping out on pit lane. So now let's take a look as it's we get we start to sort this out as to who's up front. It looks like Josh Hayes is with Cameron Peterson and Sheridan Marias. These three guys have broken away. You can see Brandon Posh just off the back of them right now. Posh's team, TOBC, did a really great job getting him in and out. So he's got a little bit of work to do. And we saw him do this last year, didn't we? We saw him kind of come from a long way back. Posh did. So we know he's capable of doing that. That said, he has nobody to draft and redraft with. And when you start thinking about three riders that know each other, Cam Peterson said earlier in the weekend that Marias was one of the people that he looked up to. And there was actually a mental to him and of course we know Cam Peterson and Josh Hayes' relationship. These three guys are not going to do anything silly to each other. They're going to continue to run like this all the way to their next pit stop and you can see just what pit stops do at this race. So what's interesting is you have two riders with Josh Hayes that are new to this race. Generally when we see experienced riders in the Daytona 200 after the first pit stop the pace will start to settle down because most of the riders in the lead group are going to understand that it's another pit stop that's going to define it and it becomes that last sprint race to the end. But Jason, looking at these two South Africans of Cameron Peterson and Sheridan Marias, they may not want to run the pace that Josh Hayes is comfortable with. And Cam Peterson into turn number one, grabs the point. So nice and tight. And Jason, did you expect to see three Yamahas running up front? Well, there was one of them I told you about that I kind of had a hedge on and I thought might do well. So he's in this battle still. But I like Brandon Posh too. 50.5 for Brandon Posh the last time through. He's running the exact same pace as these guys. So he's got to hope that these guys get a little bit of traffic and, and get slowed down ever so slightly. And that will allow him to get back in this battle. But now it's a matter of you've got somebody that spends a lot of time on a bike as far as endurance racing goes in Sheridan Marias. You've got a guy that's never even been to Daytona before in Camp Peterson. And this looks like it's Chris Sabaro is down. There's fluid on the track. I'm trying to figure out where this is, Greg, on the surface. Is this on the exit of one of the... Yeah, I can't see any yellow flags out where I'm at right now. No, so it looks like he's down. He's got some smoke going there, too. I don't know. This is That's... chicane. This is chicane. He's crashing the second part of the chicane there. Where... Where's he going? I don't have a clue. Well, that is not that that's not good. That is not a good move right yeah, there. But it looks like sketch. he's off the racetrack now. Let's see coming through this corner. I mean that that bike was leaking fluid anyway. He should be done. Shouldn't even be back out. So to our leaders, Cam Peterson, Josh Hayes, Sheridan Marias. Let's give you the order because it's Brandon Posh in fourth, but he's 1.8 seconds adrift from these three. Max Angles is in fifth, Escalante in sixth, but he's 17 seconds back after that disaster of a pit stop. Jeff May in seventh place, Harry Trulove in eighth, Hayden Gillum. And of course, where is Josh Heron? Jamie, what do you have? When he brought the bike to pit lane, uh, the crew, you know, everything happened so fast. So what they're thinking happened, the reason that it wouldn't refire is because he had, in fact, run out of gas out on the race circuit. And when that happens, when the tank gets that empty, it takes it a little bit to get it back into the fuel line. So they're thinking that that's what happened. But because it all happened so quickly and Josh back out on the circuit, they can't be certain for the next stop. And the yep. problem that he's going to have now, Greg, huh, is the fact he's got a brand new tire and he's got to push as hard as he can. And a lot of it's going to be doing it on his own. Uh, we haven't got to look to see if Heron's got anybody to run around with that can run the pace that he is running. But if you do that, you just wear out your tires that much quicker. These three guys here, they're down and they're still rolling around in the 50s. Posh that last time by, 51-3. And you can see Cam getting some chatters. It looked like he was thinking about going up the inside and Josh thought the better of that. So Sheridan Marias leads the way on his Pirelli tires. Dunlop shot, Josh Hayes in second place. And in third place, Cameron Peterson. On the high side goes Cameron Peterson with 28 laps to go in the 80th running of the Daytona 200. Our lead trio, Sheridan Marias, his first time to Daytona 200 in the race. He was here back in 2020, qualified, did laps. He had a little bit of experience, but not in the race. Jason, practicing around here and racing 
the race, especially with an eight rider draft we saw at the beginning of this race, totally different. And rookie in the Daytona 200, Cameron Peterson. These guys doing a great job. But can you think of two guys you'd rather be surrounded by than Cam Peterson and Josh Hayes? Two super intelligent guys that aren't going to do anything silly. We've really seen Cam Peterson come into his own the last couple of years. He's earned the spot that he's got this next year on that Superbike team with attack. And right now, he's showing the race intelligence that we've all known he's had for a long time. And then you got Josh Hayes there as well, four-time Superbike champ. So Sheridan Marias is in good company right now with these guys. They're all going to feel comfortable running around with each other. 50.2 for Brandon Posh that time by almost eight tenths quicker than the leader of the uh, than the second two guys there. So or three tenths quicker. So Posh still trying to chug along on that number 96 Triumph to try to get himself clawed back up into this lead group. Sheridan Marias turned 37 years old yesterday and trying to give himself a great birthday present was here in the United States racing in Moto America competition back in 2015, if you remember, with HSBK Aprilia back in the day. And so Marias, no stranger to racing here in the United States, spent a couple seasons in the States, now residing in Portugal most of the time. Family still in South Africa, two kids, wife and two kids. And this is an incredible ride by Brandon Posh, too. This young man that we've seen claw his way through. Doesn't come from a big backing like some of, some other people can. Uh, he hasn't had a lot of the same opportunities. He's traveled around the world a little bit, trying to find his footing, where he's going to be able to get a chance to ride. Comes here last year with the TSC team and wins the Daytona 200. Then went off to England and raced in the BSB Championship over there in this category, basically, on the same bike he is on now. And we haven't really got to see him mix it up with the likes of Cam Peterson and Josh Hayes or even Sheridan Marias over the years. We haven't got to see that. But now he's proven that he is more than capable as he has clawed back into these guys. He is just off the back of them. I think he's closed it down to under a second now, Greg, and we'll check it when they come across the line. Posh is now in that lead trio, 0.4 off the leader. Unbelievable ride. And sometimes that's what you have to do after these. Or trying to get moved over and out of the way. So Brandon Posh on the TOBC Triumph. Right back in tow. Still leading the way though, or leading the way I should say again, is going to be Cameron Peterson. On that attack performance Yamaha. Sheridan Marias also on a Yamaha R6. Both of those bikes on those Pirelli tires on the Stenanix racing team. For Sheridan Marias. And Josh Hayes, of course, right now flying the flag for Dunlop. And uh, on that Squid Hunter Yamaha R6. And that little look over the shoulder for Brandon probably gave him a big sigh of relief. He's done the job that he needed to do to get back up onto the back of these three. He doesn't have any pressure from behind. He can now try to just run the same pace, not overuse his tires, not overuse his machine. And the pressure now, really, Greg, is going to come again in, the, in about 14 laps from now. All of these teams have pit crews that are probably down there nervous about making sure they get their rider in and out of this pit as quickly as they can. Then you've got to say, Marias' team and I think Josh Hayes' team probably just did a, li a little tiny bit better than TOBC and the attack team. But all four had nice pit stops. The guys behind, just so we know, Max Angles is running fifth. He is running around the track right now with Escalante. Jeff May is running around by himself in seventh, and Hayden Gillum is eighth, True Love ninth, Danny Eslick in tenth after him running out of gas and coasting down pit lane. We go back to Richie Escalante. He had a tremendous stop being able to pick up some positions here on pit lane. Uh, the team is very happy with that, the job that he's doing in their first race together for the 2022 season. He'll make the move up to Superbike. He won't stay in Supersport uh, for this season. But I want to talk about his teammate also, Sam Lockoff. We saw him come to pit road, uh, one of the first callers to pit lane, and it did not go as well for him. The problem there was the stand didn't go all the way in. So the bike was leaning, knocked the caliber out, took him several minutes, and now he's no longer a factor in this race. Yeah, it's tough for Sam Lockoff, but he has gained a ton of experience. And talking to Sam Lockoff, teammate, of course, to Richie Escalante as we watch. Jason, you mentioned it. Here's Max Angles on the 64 and Richie Escalante on the 54. But in terms of Sam Lockoff, he's a favorite for the Moto America Super Sport title this year. And this was a great learning experience for him, the young South African. Yeah, it would have been nice to see him be able to go through to the last uh, 
like session of this race, get through a couple of pit stops and still have these guys within sniffing distance. So it's a shame to see that happen to him. They obviously had a strategy where they were going to bring one rider in just before. Nothing wrong with the strategy, just a shame that that front tire didn't go in for him a little bit easier. Uh, lost a couple of laps. The guys behind these are 18 seconds back, are Angles and Escalante. And they got to remember, they got to just keep their heads down and keep doing what they're doing because the same fate can happen to any one of these four riders or all four riders as far as pit stops go. Um, you, you know, that's that's just the that's the way this race runs, Greg. It's not always, you know, even though all of them are about the same speed, the fastest guy on the track can sometimes just get lost a little bit in the pits. This is the 80th running of the Daytona 200, a 57-lap affair, 57 laps minimum, by the way. We've gone seven laps, then we had a red flag and a restart. And so for this 50-lap restart, we have 24 to go from these leaders as Josh Hayes on the Squid Hunter Yamaha R6 will lead again. And Jason, I just can't help but think about what this field looks like in terms of motorcycles balancing for the future of the super sport class the first opportunity to see it we have seen ducati triumph kawasaki suzuki and yamaha all running very equal paces and looked very equal and very uh you know they were they were each motorcycles they could fight with on the banking here at Daytona. Yeah, there's no question. Scott Smart, I know, has been uh, a key component in drawing up the rules going forward in the World Super Sport categories, which Moto America has obviously got along with as well. A little concerned right now seeing Posh dropping off the back end of these guys just a little bit. It's been a struggle for Posh the last lap and a half. Once he got there, huh? It seemed like once he got there, it became a little bit more difficult. And that's really the problem. When you have a pit stop that's not perfect, you lose a little bit of time, is how much tire do you use versus the riders up front that have settled into this nice, comfortable pace? The lead keeps changing, but it's really just kind of one of those situations. Josh Hayes, definitely, who has endurance experience in the United States, plenty of it. He's done some world endurance as well, has yeah. Josh. He wants the lead going through traffic. Why wouldn't you, Jay? Yeah, but if you watch these guys, they're very synchronized. Nobody's, you haven't seen any big passes. You haven't seen anybody messing with anybody in the infield. These guys are all rolling around together, all doing the smart things as they would. And you can see this Brandon Posh now, he's going to be able to get in Cam Peterson's draft as they come across Trioval. So he's going to get drawn back up. But the thing is, Greg, is all three of these guys, they're kind of just synchronized. They know right now that they just got to get through this next pit stop, and that's when the race is going to start. And, and to be fair, this is probably what it's going to look like if they all three get out of the pits, all four get out of the pits identical. These four guys are going to be the guys that are going to decide the podium if they can just get make sure that they're, they're in and out the way they need to get. And this is where the in lap, when you see that board say in and the out lap, they are crucial. Josh Hayes, his out lap, I watched him from up top here. When he went down to the International Horseshoe on the pit lane, he was flying, Greg, and he saw these two guys coming and got just in front of them as they exited the International Horseshoe. And also looking at the riders in this top four group, it's only Brandon Posh that actually has an active teammate. And I say that, Josh Hayes on that Squid Hunter Yamaha is all by himself. And you have Sheridan Marias on that Centanic, Centanic Racing Team. A new team for me, Jason, who's also solo. And of course, because of the exit of Jake Gagne early on in this race camp, Peterson is also by himself. 23 laps remain in the 80th running of the Daytona 200 with still a pit stop to go. Cameron Peterson moves up into second place. And Jason, this is the part of the race where we look at these three, even, even Brandon Posh, who just keeps putting his nose in there to say, these three right now are very comfortable with how each other's racing this race. Yeah, and Brandon's going to be the same way. He's going to be just behind these guys. He's not going to do anything silly. He knows he needs to be there for 200 laps. He's showing why he won the race last year, and you can see that TOBC Triumph is now on the back of these other three bikes. And right, I, I promise you, all four of these guys are having a great time right now. They're just clicking off the laps. They're in the, they're in the 50s still, 51 flat for Hayes that time through. The other guys are in the 50s, so it's like they're basically all going around together. 
And there's no threats coming from behind, Nothing. meaning Richie Escalante has moved his way to fifth around Max Angles for the moment, even though they're still locking horns. But they're doing basically identical lap times to what Hayes, Peterson, Marias, and Posh are doing. Marias makes a small mistake there, gets himself back in line. There's going to be nothing wrong with that. And you know, the thing is, is that Posh, he's probably the only one so far that has seen on his board plus 18 if they are showing the gap back to the guys behind. And that gap has stayed exactly like you say, Greg. It's been 18 seconds for the last four laps. Those guys in fourth and fifth, the exact same lap times essentially as the guys leading the race. So Jason, and looking at Sheridan Marias, when I talked to Sheridan, he had mentioned that he and the team were not going to take tires. They were just going to take on gas. But Jamie, what do you know from being down in the pits? Well, I just talked to him, and it's a great team, a great uh, introduction into Moto America for them. And they laughed, and they said, we're just doing it so fast that you didn't, you didn't notice. They did take both front and rear tires, and they're going to plan on doing the same at the second stop. All right, thanks for that information. So, all right, Sheridan, you gave me that info, and you guys did something different. And it makes sense, though, Jason. <laughs> if every Everybody else is taking front and rear tire. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't? Why wouldn't you want to do the same? Yeah, well, look, that crew down there. When you told me some information last night, I was thinking they're the most experienced crew here as far as getting people in and out of any pit around the world. I mean, you got to remember in a 24-hour nerds race, there's a, a pit stop every hour. So, um, and Sheridan's used to double stinting and doing two hours at a time on a thousand. So that's not going to be any problem for them or for him. So why put yourself at a disadvantage by not putting the best rubber that you can put on the motor? cycle as you can see Hayes drafts back up underneath and uh, these four guys off into turn one again that time a little bit slower in the sense that none of them were in the 50s they're all in the low 51s yeah and that pass was more of a momentum pass that's just kind of Hayes has got the draft he's just going around and just putting himself in position and you sense it and you feel it. You get used to where guys are going to be. You can, when you're leading, Greg, you can feel somebody in your draft getting ready to go past you. You can actually feel yourself almost getting drugged back because you see the 16 of Kevin Almeido there just in front of these guys. Now, Almeido, where's he running, Greg? Because we didn't get to see his, I saw him come in the pits, but he's not in the top 20 now. There's On the right part of your screen is the battle for fifth place. That's between Max Angles and Richie Escalante. And Jason, that one keeps going on and on as they are running around uh, about two or three tenths a second quicker than our leaders currently. But unfortunately for Angles and Escalante, they find themselves 18 seconds behind the leading four. And it just continues to stay. Like you say, Greg, it's the exact same time, 18 seconds every lap. But they have somebody to go with. This would be a lot harder if they were on their own alone. So the fact that they can draft and redraft each other and maintain themselves, uh, of, of course, on this lead lap. And I'm trying to get a count on how many people right now are on this lead lap. Danny Eslick has gone across in 10th. Shout out, Chris Paris in 11th. Heron is 12th. Matt Trulove is there in 13th. His brother is 9th. So the Trulove brothers are almost both in the top 10. Saltese is going to be 14th. And Rocco Landers is rounding out the top 15. At the moment, Hannah, looking at Cam Peterson, what do you think? Well, guys, you'd never know by looking at him that this is Cameron Peterson's first Daytona 200. You know, despite so many new challenges, it's really confidence inspiring to him. When you look at the crew and their history here at the 200, Richard Stamboli has won three championship titles with Chaz Davies, Rap, and Danny Eslick. Walker won with Eslick alongside Stamboli. Marshall's won four, one with Nikki Hayden, twice with Dumel, and one with Zemke. And not to mention, John Cornwell's a six-time Daytona 200 crew chief, seven if you count this weekend. That's, well, <laughs> that is quite the resume. <laughs> that That's unreal. A, you had to have written that all down, Hannah, because that is a lot of information right there to gain, and, uh, and good information it is. Here you go back again, Greg. It's a battle for fifth. Angles and Escalante still locked at it. That time they dropped a second off, so they're 19 seconds now. Yeah, that's. but the situation is is that when you do get in a rhythm with riders like this, unless someone is out there setting the pace and can drag you up to the lead group. Now, Jason, but this is not the worst strategy in the world, right? It's, it's instead of push, 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 and try to close that gap, could it be a situation where now for Richie Escalante, he does have complete faith in his crew. He knows that when he gets that pit board and when he gets into pits that they're going to be prepared for it and possibly make up some time. The problem is, is that 
you're not going to make up 19 seconds on four riders that are in front of you. No, nope, that is exactly right. The 19 seconds is going to be the hardest part, and really things will start to play out after we see this second pit stop. You can see there's a, a small gap now. I, I'm really, really impressed with Max Angle. Say, how can you not be? We haven't ever really got to see him up at the front, and he's led the Daytona 200 today. It's just a shame. Again, pit stops were his undoing, or the first one was at least. Hopefully that crew can get him in and out better in the second one because he's shown today that he is capable of running up front. And this is going to do really well for him as he gets going forward in the rest of our Moto America season as the leaders come across the stripe again. Angles and Escalante. You can see Escalante's bike moving around in the rear a lot at the top of that banking right now. He's going to get back down and get in the draft. Well, now we have 19 laps to go, and if this was a non-red flag Daytona 200 race, it would be right around the time when we're looking at that second pit stop window. And so with 19 to go, the question is, who's going to be able to push it to the, le like the latest laps to get the freshest tires and a quicker pit stop? Because if you're sitting there, you don't need a full fuel load to go distance, then the team's going to calculate that instead of putting in the entire fuel load they can put in only what they need to get to the finish and do the cool down lap. Yeah, it's a scary proposition because if you're out there pushing your own wind, you're going to be burning more fuel. If you're in the draft with people, you're going to be using a little bit less. And that's what I think I've really loved seeing about Posh today. He's been able to get in that draft. And even at the beginning of this race, when we saw Hayes and Posh kind of sitting at the back of that seven and eight rider group, they're, they're just conserving their bike, conserving their bikes, their energy, their tires. They're just a little bit less hard on equipment. Brandon made the joke with me before the race today. I, I, I had been talking to him about things. And he goes, Jay, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a bigger guy, you know, and he was worried about that. And he's I said, tall. Hey, you're he's gonna, tall. He's, he's tall. Yeah, he's very, very tall kid. But uh, you can see he's done what he needs to do to continue to put himself in this mix as these guys come out of the chicane up onto that banking. When they come through this time, Greg, 18 to go. And I think that we're going to start getting into that window, aren't we? We're going to start getting into that window pretty soon of when these guys are going to pit. The later you pit, the better your tires will be at the end. And that's really what it's about. So hearts are going to start pounding down in the pits as this very unique race this solo 57 lap race with pit stops is a different environment for these motorcycle sprint racing teams where all of a sudden as a crew you become so important right in the middle of the race sheridan marias back up to the front with josh hayes cameron peterson and brandon posh all hanging around so jason are you seeing anything uh, you know in terms of Something you wouldn't see at Daytona in terms of lines or what they're doing. One of the things I wanted to try to break down is why Posh is losing so much time on the infield. And it could be something as simple as maybe he's got a little taller second gear coming out of these horseshoes than the other R6s in front of him. Because you see how this gap kind of gets bigger in the infield. And then he's able to kind of run him back down on the banking. And he told me at the beginning he didn't feel like his bike was very fast compared to some of the other bikes that you have seen. So maybe he's just got a little bit taller second gear makes it a little bit harder to get off of some of these sh shorter second gear corners can see that gap there that's the difference that you can see through the infield almost each lap but then he claws his way back in the chicane where they're going to be rolling through in third gear a little more rpm through the middle of that corner hopefully for that triumph and he can draft back up with him so we have about 17 and a half laps to go in the 80th running of the daytona 200 and still a pit stop to go. We have four out front, Marias, Hayes, Peterson, and Posh. The high banks of Daytona for the 80th running of the Daytona 200 in the middle of it as we are on a run to start finish line with our lead group. Jason Pridmore. Did you see that triumph there, Greg? It's just drafted back up with these guys. He's right on the back of him, but he's not, he's not, not showing his hand. I love that it. That is exactly the question I was getting yep. ready to ask you. Yep. Do you think that Brandon Posh is just chilling and not showing anybody anything and just relying on this second pit stop to put him right back into this lead group and then save it for the end? Yep, I fully think he is. Now, see, as he comes out of turn one, they're going to go back to second there, and a lot of these guys, he doesn't get pulled away from so much there. But out of this 
horseshoe and the next one, that's where you start to see this little bit of a gap. You see how they just pull away? So, and you can see Cam Peterson nodding his head. That could have been saying pit in this lap. So we're going to keep an eye on the 45 and see if he ducks down pit lane with what, Greg? We're going to have 16 to go when they come by. So, but yeah, you can see that gap again like we're just talking about. All right, so will Cameron Peterson duck into the pit? And it looks like from our vantage point that Richie Escalante's in. Yep. So there's a, a look at Richie Escalante in his only super sport appearance of the 2022 season, as we expect, as the Vision Wheel M4X star Suzuki rider will be, as you've heard earlier, on a super bike for the rest of the season. You can see him looking over to the left. He's looking up at the big pylon here that kind of tells you what place you're in. You saw him shake his head. Sixth place right now because Angles obviously went around for one more lap. These three guys. Now let's have a look and see if Cam peels in here. We're going to have to have a look. So Cam Peterson doing the smart thing, trying to get out front and go as fast as he can on his in lap. Yeah, he's not going to come in this lap, Greg. Not with Marias down there, I don't believe. So he's not going to go that high up in the bank and but Marias is. So here comes Sheridan Marias into the pits. So out of the lead group. But of course, this all gets sorted out. Oh, and a, and a rider down. Is that Angles? Is, is it 64? It looks like it is. It's, it's Max, Max Angles. Angles. So it looks like Max, was he coming out of the pits, Jason? It looks like the chicane again. It looks like that same place that we saw earlier, Greg. It is. It's the exit of the chicane. Angles is down. But let's get look at the pit stop right now for Marias. He is in and rolling. Is they going to try to get Angles started and get going again? Oh, this is devastating for the 64. Marias is out. Another really nice pit stop from his team is going to see him with two really good stops in this Daytona 200. And the 113 is back out with two fresh tires, it looks like. Down to 60K. Down 60K speed limit, 37 miles per hour. So Marias will come on out onto the track. And so they have set the benchmark. Pressure's on, isn't it? I was just going to say the same thing. Pressure's on now for those other crews. Jamie, what would you see down there? Well, the team had been practicing the stops last night. We see how quick they are today, but that came after they realized, after their first practice, that they were making mistakes. You talk about this is what they do for a living. They're endurance racers, but the rules are a little bit different here in Moto America. They had to get that right. They have executed two perfect stops today. You see the standing yellow flag. Thanks, Jamie. You see the standing yellow flag still. That's probably going to be for them trying to get Max Angle's bike or him either started or out of the way. These two guys are out of the chicane now with Brandon Posh just off the back of them. I'm looking down pit lane, Greg, to see if any of the crew are out yet. It looks like Hayes could be coming in soon because I could see people down there as they come off the tri-oval. Yes, one of them is ducking in. It is going to be Josh Hayes. No, oh, so sorry, it's Cam Peterson. Peterson. So yes. Cam Peterson's coming in to the pits. So the second pit stop. Let's see if they can get a cleaner one because they were having trouble with that front wheel uh, during that pit stop. So here's a look at the attack performance Yamaha. So here comes one of your race leaders rolling down pit lane. With the pit speed limiter on. The team is ready for it. So here we go. Cameron Peterson is going to get into his pit stall. Hannah, take it away. He's just coming to his stuff now, hopping off the butt. The team is really calm, you guys, for such an urgent matter. Everybody is very calm, collected. That rear wheel's going back in. Stamboli got that front wheel in nice and tight, really easy this time. A near flawless pit stop for Cameron Peterson. Rear axle's being tightened into that captain nut, and off he goes. Yeah, that was a good one, Jason. It's a great one. You see the boss there on the front wheel, Richard Stamboli all hands on and they, they, I would expect nothing less Hannah than to see a bunch of crew members that are going to be nice and relaxed they don't want to make their rider feel like he's under any big stress let's just get him in and out of here clean now Josh Hayes I promise you right now has got his head down he's going to probably be coming in this lap as will maybe Brandon Posh the only advantage that they might have Greg is if they come in together they might be able to get out together but we're going to be seeing the number four and the number 96 coming down pit lane I gotta think this lap. So Hayes has had his head down, trying to put in this great last lap on this set of tires. I can see from our position too that the TOBC team, they have a lot of personnel sitting on that wall in anticipation of Brandon Posh coming in. And for the Squid Hunter crew, experience in the Daytona 200 
It's all the pressure. The clean pit stop. Here comes Hayes. So he's peeled off the racetrack and Posh continues on. So now the pressure's on for another clean lap. And the way this 200 works, if everything's good, Hayes should come out on the racetrack with your race leaders. It should be Cameron Peterson and Sheridan Marias pretty close together. And this is where the experience is going to come in for this guy right here. This guy has gone in and out of this pit lane a million times. He did it perfect the first time, Greg. So that crew down there, they've got to just do everything they can to get these tires and that fuel in the bike as clean as possible. Shoot him back out. And this could be... The, 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 the Daytona 200 that Josh Hayes has been wanting to do for the last couple of years. And Hayes with the bottle gets a little bit of a sip as, w along with his motorcycle. He throws that bottle over the wall and just like that, very rhythmic. And it's one or two seconds, but he's off. So not a perfect pit stop, but a well-executed pit stop by the Squid Hunter team. Marias goes through the tri-oval right now. So Marias is gonna be actually maybe a little bit ahead. So it tells me that Marias' crew just a ting better than was Hayes. Hayes is down the, uh, out of pit lane now as we look at Brandon Posh, our leader. Well, it wasn't a perfect pit stop. There was a round of applause from the Squid Hunters team following that stop. Yes, Josh Hayes has done this a million times. So this is his very first race, his first weekend with this new organization. They're all gelling together. They're happy with their performance there. And they should be, right, Jason? Yeah, they got out in front of, uh, they got just in front of Sheridan as they were coming out of the International Horseshoe. He was able to beat Sheridan out. So those two guys are tied together now. Now, where was Cam? We got to look for Cam in that group too. Yeah, for Cameron Peterson, we're talking about him. We still have eyes on Brandon Posh, who is the race leader at the moment. So Posh, again, comes across the stripe. When is Brandon Posh gonna get his way into the pits? Well, he's gonna have good Boy. tires. He's gonna have, what, two or three less laps, and we gotta make sure that they don't run him out of gas. That's the downfall of Danny Eslick today. We saw him run out of gas by doing one extra lap, and right now, Brandon Posh off into the International Horseshoe. He goes. And Jason, this is the issue with having the weather that we had earlier this weekend, is teams might not have had all the data they need to figure out exactly how long these motorcycles can go each of these laps, because the question is, you're not gonna put in 100% full fuel load with only maybe 12 laps to go for Brandon Posh, so you got to make sure you measure that correctly to give Posh the lightest motorcycle with the freshest tires to give him the best chance to win this race. Yeah, no question, and that's the pressure that a lot of these teams have. Now, I'm looking down. I see Danny Eslick entering pit lane right now. Posh is about 30 seconds, 40 seconds from pit lane as he comes out of turn six and onto the big banking that's going to take him down the back straightaway. Eslick is on pit lane right now, so they're going to want to do everything they can to get him in and out as fast as they can so that when Posh comes down pit lane he sees nothing but the crew he needs to see. And I can tell you from the movement from his crew that we can see from our vantage point that this might be the lap where Posh comes in because initially it looked like one crew went over the wall thinking that it, and Danny Eslick is in and out just like that Jay. And there was no tire changes on that bike for Danny Eslick so he's trying to make up a little bit of track position. You saw him come in, get out and they knew that Brandon Posh was going to be coming in so they wanted to get him out as quickly as they can. He is on the banking right now going through turn four. Expect to see this young man duck down in his bid to try to win the second Daytona 200. And he's going around again, Greg. This is unreal. So Brandon Bosch continues to circulate. Boy, we certainly hope he's got enough fuel in that Triumph. And maybe that's a, a hallmark of this triple in terms of the fuel consumption because we know it can definitely make the power. So Posh continues to lead this race. There are 12 laps remaining. And then we have Harry Trulove in second spot, still out there circulating. And then it's gonna be Cameron Peterson, Jeff May, Josh Hayes, Sheridan Marias. So right now, Cam Peterson's in the catbird seat, really. He got out ahead of both Hayes and Marias, hasn't he? So we missed that a little bit, Greg. And, and so Cam Peterson right now has got a bit of a gap on those two guys as well. We're looking at our commentary spot right now to see if I can see him coming towards the tri-oval. And I do see him coming across, I believe, right now. And, and Greg, he has got about four, maybe three to four seconds on Marias and Hayes right now. So those guys are both going to have to do everything they can to catch up to Cam Peterson because he's three or four seconds ahead of but the question is, what does Brandon Posh have and the team in terms of a pit stop? 
it, when Posh dips in and gets his fuel and gets his tires, if they choose tires, where is he going to end up on the racetrack? Will it be with Cameron Peterson? Will it be with Sheridan Marias and Josh Hayes or Jason? Could it be in between and give Marias and Hayes something to chase after and close this gap because it's around four seconds between Cameron Peterson and Sheridan Marias, who's in second place, but still leading on the racetrack is Brandon Posh, last year's winner. On this Triumph Triple, 765. And it looks like it's when, time. When you're down low like that, a lot of times that means you're coming in. So we'll see if he comes down pit lane, Greg. He is. He, bra he breaks off of the turn four uh, banking. He's going to go back through the gears, get on the brakes as hard as he can, get that bike into the pit lane speed limiter. You can see him looking down at his left handlebar, gets that bike where it needs to be. I was worried about gas there for Brandon, but he is in pit lane, and the TOBC crew are down there waiting for him. Let's go to Hannah. Posh is jumping off the bike. It looks like they're having trouble getting that center stand in and getting the bike lifted. It is lifted. We are refueling. It looks like they're waiting on tires. It's not looking like they're going to change the tires. They're going to send them back out after a refuel here. What a gamble this is going to be here. Brandon Posh is back out. And Greg, this is all about track position. Those tires look so good to them right now that they didn't feel they needed to change them. And so that's going to be a big difference. As I can see, Brandon, he is going to be at the end of pit lane. Cam Peterson's going across start finish line right now. Now, the one benefit that Brandon has, he doesn't have to worry about brand new tires going down this very skinny pit lane. But Cam Peterson is going around the outside of him right now in turn one, as you see on our screen. And that is Brandon Posh. Brandon's going to be able to get up to speed quick. And there's about 0.01 of a mile. There they are side by side, Peterson. But you can see where the blend line is. So Cameron Peterson already getting out of this corner, but it's posh. It looks like he's going to put himself in between Jason, yep. Cameron Peterson, and Marias oh, and Hayes. Only just. So Bosch got out just, just in front of Marias and Hayes. This guy right now, the 45, Cam Peterson, just signing on with this team, is leading the Daytona 200 with 11 laps to go. And he has got about three seconds that lap through over uh, over Marias and Josh Hayes. So right now that gap's about three seconds, but he's got three guys behind him that are all going to be working together. And you have guys that have a ton of experience. You have Sheridan Marias, who's got that world endurance experience, and we are making our way through a lot of lap traffic. Josh Hayes, who has world endurance, U.S. endurance experience, and of course, a ton of Daytona 200 experience. And of course, you have Brandon Posh, who won this race last year. All the while, new territory for Cameron Peterson on his new team for 2022. He'll be racing for Richard Stamboli and his team in Moto America in the Superbike class on the control tire Dunlops. Now on a Yamaha R6. It had been so many years since Cameron Peterson had been on a six, uh, on a 600cc machine and on Pirelli's. And just to let you know, his last lap by was a 51.5. The guys behind him are in the 50s, 50.7 for both Marias and Hayes. So what Cam Peterson's got to do now is just try to click off the laps as easy and as best as he can because the next three guys are all locked in together. Second, third, and fourth, Marias, Hayes, Posh. You can see they're 4.4 seconds back, 50.3 that last time by for Cam Peterson. So he opened up the gap that he had lost the lap prior. And this is where Marias, Hayes, and Posh have got to not rough each other up and slow each other down. That is that 4.4 seconds that all of a sudden can find itself to five, six, and seven. And with 10 laps to go, these three have got to work together. And you got to think, Greg, that this could be where the gamble doesn't pay off possibly for TOBC. If Brandon doesn't have that fresh tire underneath him, and these guys have, these guys are going to be able to maybe get away from him. And I can already start to see that just as they come. Now, Posh came out of pit lane actually ahead of these two. And you can see the distance that he's kind of lost here at the beginning of his real first flying lap. So. These two guys, last time through 51 seventh, that could have been, um, they could have had some traffic on that lap, so those lap times could be traffic inspired as well. I mean, but, but Cam was only a tenth off his fastest lap of the race. Got it ready to say that. I mean, that's how focused Cameron Peterson is out front. So to give you the running orders, you can see the left part of your screen, Cameron Peterson, Sheridan Marias, Josh Hayes, Brandon Posh, who's starting to lose touch with these two. Richie Escalante, Jeff May, True Love in seventh place. 
Eslick in eighth, Gillum. Heron recovering from tenth, Paris. True Love, Soltis, Landers, and James who's in the pits. And I know it sounds crazy, but 10 laps is a lot of laps still to go around here. And those guys can actually see Cam Peterson up the road. And they can especially get a sniff of him when they go down into the chicane. They can see him midway through the chicane. And they just got to keep chipping away the best they can. They got to kind of hope a little bit that Cam gets a little bad luck or bad breaks through traffic. And, and that will draw that back. I'm looking out the window now. Cam is actually, Peterson is actually catching up to the back of an M4 bike out the window. And these two guys here, they got to continue to do what they did before. Not get in each other's way, not rough each other up, just kind of keep drafting and redrafting each other up on that banking. And this is the part of the Daytona 200 that is so exciting. The pit stops are done. The fuel load is what you got. Your tires are underneath you. It's what you got till the end of the race. And there is lap traffic scattered all over Daytona International Speedway. The 80th running of the Daytona 200 with only nine laps to go, and Cameron Peterson, a Daytona 200 rookie, leading by 3.8 seconds. And these are the these are the kind of things right here, Greg, that you like to see. They've got Chris Paris just in front. Chris Paris running 11th place is going to be a fast rider, but these guys are going to get a nice toe off of him down the back straightaway. Marias is going to get a double draft. These are the kind of things that help you draw up closer to Cam Peterson. So I think this year our field itself has probably been one of the fastest fields that we've seen here in many, many years. Yeah, without question. With Moto America taking over the Daytona 200, and elevating this back up to international status. Incredible teams, incredible riders showed up to make their mark. Josh Hayes and Sheridan Marias, the battle for second and third. Cam Peterson has some clear track in front of him. Actually, he's got a couple back markers that he's just gonna be able to kind of get his way through. The other two are stuck, but they are able to make their way through too. And look at Posh. Posh, every time I think he's not there, he's back. He's, he's back. He's back. And he just runs a 49.9 for Brandon Posh. Unbelievable. Jamie. And remember that 49.9, that's coming on the second stint of that set of Pirellis. I checked in with the team to see why they decided not to change tires on that second stop. They're logging every single lap. And he said the consistency that came off of that first set of tires told him we're going to save the time. It could be 19 seconds that we're, that we're saving ourselves. We're putting it in the bank for later on in the race. They were able to get a better running out of pit lane because of it. This stint only needs three more laps. So they're, they're feeling good about going to the checkers. Well, that's the... It's a great strategy. The problem is it's 4.3 seconds behind your race leader, Cameron Peterson, who right now is still, he just clicked off a 50.0. So Cameron Peterson out front just went and did one tenth of a second off the fastest lap of the race, which was Brandon Posh just a moment ago. And he's half a second quicker than was that of Hayes or Marias. So again, the seesaw, they're about 4.3 back. And you know, now Brandon, if he can get by these guys, he's got to kind of do it, doesn't he? And that, there's lock off. So Cam Peterson, you know, when you see that fast lap time, I had made mention that he is ca caught up to an M4 rider. I couldn't see out my window exactly who that was. But again, he's got a fast guy in front of him, so Cam Peterson's going to be able to draft and go with that guy, and that's going to make his lap time a little bit better. Sheridan Marias coming down off the banking with Josh Hayes in tow. There goes Brandon Posh around lap traffic. He's got a great run right now on these two guys in front of him. Look at the triumph as he comes up around the outside of them a little bit. Yeah, it makes you think, too, that he had something in reserve, possibly. It's 2.8, Greg. 52-3 that time for Cam Peterson. So he must have had that traffic that I saw him get stuck behind in turn one. Slowed him down just a little bit. These guys have clawed that way back from 4.3 to 2.8. And they're going to be able to see him a lot closer. It's part of the characteristic here at Daytona International Speedway. Additionally, Jason, there are scoring pylons located around this racetrack that oh. riders oh yeah 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 that's a little bit close this late in the race almost looked like josh was letting sheridan by and then i saw josh look over and give him some room as they exited the horseshoe but these guys now can see the leader and the leader is running around with lock off see there's lock off there who's going fast in his own right right now so he is going to be another guy that if these guys start to catch up a little bit he's going to pull them along and around the banking 
Oh, your heart's got to be pounding now with six and a half laps to go. Marias, Hayes, and Bosch are trying to get everything they can out of their motorcycles to close the gap between a solo Cameron Peterson. All the while, he's got a young rider on the Vision Wheel M4XR Suzuki behind him. And I'm looking out some 20 or 30 seconds in front of these guys uh, out my window, and I only see maybe one or two uh, possible lapped riders going through. And most of the lap riders that I see are, are, are fast guys that are, that are in the top 10. So it'll take them a while to catch up to some of those guys. But now those three guys can really work together. That's the key. That's what they that, gotta do. That is the key of working together. It doesn't look like Posh has got the infield speed to want to even take the lead. Yeah, but he doesn't need it if he can get a run through the chicane and stay close to these guys. He hasn't shown these guys one time going across the trioval if he has the ability to pass them. And you and I don't know if he has the ability to pass them. Brandon knows if he has it, though. He knows if he's letting off at all as they go through the trioval. And you can see all of our leading four now are in the same picture, and that's Lockoff in between them. So Lockoff now will probably hear this three coming up, or he'll have a look over his shoulder and see those guys coming. He's not going to do it here but it's okay Lockoff he can keep his head down because he's not gonna hold these guys up yeah but if Lockoff's in a really good position it could help these three that's what I mean when exactly. they get on that banking because 100%. he's got a fast enough motorcycle he could give them a great slingshot or if he's not quite holding the pace infield he could hold them up because there you go Lockoff finally looks over his shoulder he's gonna let him go that's as the blue such, flag waves such a good move from Lockoff and he can go just jump right in the back now I, I almost promise you that even though he got out of the way Hayes was probably thinking all right leave me up onto this bank and yeah. give me a toe that's what but, I was uh, thinking but Lockoff very heads up play there from Sam and uh, he'll be back trying to win this race again next year can't help but get the feeling that Cameron Peterson is a sitting duck out there by himself because it's all about this draft and passing here at Daytona International Speedway on these high banks and at least these three riders well Jay right now you have posh there but it's Hayes and Marias are really playing with each other yeah and Marias got in a little bit deep there a little bit wide as you could see and, and put him a little bit wide in the chicane this is when Josh actually just ran the fastest lap of his race at a 50.3 now posh posh sooner or later has got a I mean he's probably playing it pretty cool right now he knows that Camp Peterson is just up the road as well and uh, let's see does he See how he's letting, I yeah, think he's letting I out. Think he's letting out. I, mean, I, I really do believe it. He's rolling off ever so and, slightly. And these guys can look back and see him there, but he's not shown anything to these guys. Wow. All right, Jamie, what do you think? Well, talking with Josh Hayes this morning, he was sitting down. He was very reflective, you know, as he is. He's not one of these young guys that are trying to make a name for himself. He already has a name for himself. He was out here. He said, I'm not here just to race. I am here to win. He said, I can put together 57 good solid laps. I know that I can do that. He's done it so far today. There's only five laps remaining in this race, and he was seeing this race as an opportunity to do something heroic, come from the back, get to the front. He's proven so much today, Hannah. And Jamie, he's running alongside a very good friend of his. You know, Cameron Peterson and him have a lot of camaraderie, a lot of history. They've worked together for many, many years. There is so much mutual respect between them, but they are both incredibly stand-up guys, both on and off the track. We're going to see a battle fight to this finish, but it will be clean racing. And as far as Cameron Peterson's concerned, before this, the longest stint that he had was yesterday during the first qualifying. But he said the bike feels really good under the light fuel load. He knows he's going to make sure he's going to be up there in the end. Yeah, that's good stuff. And right now he's got Max Angles, who is one of our front runners, just up in front of him right now. If he can close that gap down as they go down the back straightaway, Camp Peterson's going to get a nice toe around the turn three and four bank. And you can see the 64 of Angles on that Kawasaki. He's going to lead him through. And actually, it, it maybe it slowed him up yeah, a little I mean, bit there, didn't Max it? Max was down, that too, action, so yeah. he could be having some problems after he goes down. So Max Angles through the chicane wasn't as fast as he was early on. No. Nope. And that could prove problematic for Cameron Peterson. Greg, they're going to be on him on the next couple laps I really do believe it you can see these guys closing in there's Cam Peterson on that white R6 that Yamaha uh, that you see Max Angles in behind him and then this trio second third and fourth all coming after the number 45 and that's the thing Jason when you have someone drafting you as close as Max was drafting Peterson it can slow you down a little bit you can feel the pull on it so now they are so close there's not a lot between them as Cameron Peterson 
trying to get around this lap traffic. And again, Jason, it's about learning, learning traffic, learning drafting, learning Daytona, learning these Pirelli tires, getting familiar with a inline 600 CC, especially Yamaha R6 and how far they spin up in the rev range. There's so many things to get used to. And that huge gap that Cameron Peterson had of over four seconds is now down to less than a second. And these guys are just licking their chops. And I'll tell you right now, it's, it's gonna be one of those things Everybody's put in all this hard work. All the crews have done their job of these four motorcycles to get these guys tied in and tied together. And now it's just a matter of who is going to make a little mistake. Ill, will there be any mistakes? We're going to have four riders coming across the line here, Greg, in about four laps. But we just don't know what order it's going to, order it's going to be in. The Daytona 200 that you love to see. The 80th running bringing you spectacular race action. As Sheridan Marias will go around Josh Hayes, use that slingshot, Hayes back in the draft. All the while, these two are dragging themselves closer to Cameron Peterson, who's out there pushing his own air. And then all the while, Brandon Posh just hanging out, hanging out. Brandon's just hanging out, isn't he? I mean, he is just there, fastest lap of the race for that TOBC bike number 96 that you see in fourth place. And now, Greg, now he's in a position where he can see these three guys in front of him and use the draft as you see Melissa Paris looking on at her bike that's ripping around one of her bikes along with the Squint Hunter Racing Team. Melissa Paris is so hands-on on the program. And now they've caught him, Greg, with three to go. It's a battle royal. So here we are. It's a three-lap sprint race to decide who is the Daytona 200 winner for the 80th time. And Cameron Peterson. The patience of Josh right there. He could have slid up underneath Marias. No reason to do it. Now it's a point of just being patient. But that 96, he's got to be worrying if these guys know he's back there. And the question now for Cameron Peterson is what does he have underneath him? Has it been lap traffic that has slowed him down because he just got passed? So all of a sudden, just like that, we have a new leader in Sheridan Marias. And the question for Brandon Posh is, when it comes down to that final drive out of the chicane, does he have enough rear tire underneath him? Well, I think he does. I really do believe it. And I think that if he stays close, anywhere close, like if he's this close coming out of the last lap, he is close enough to try to slingshot these guys. Now, Marias, I think there, there could have been, you know, Peterson's got a board on Sam Pipe. Plus three, plus two, plus one, plus zero. And nobody loves to lead here, as we know. Could we start to see a little bit of gamemanship as far as who wants to lead going out of that chicane on the last lap? Who feels like they got the run to the checkered flag? Two and a half laps to go. Can Brandon Posh break Yamaha's heart or can Yamaha fill the podium? As Cameron Peterson goes back to the lead, he wants to lead through the chicane. There's some more lap traffic just up ahead. Three of these motorcycles, Pirelli shot, one, Dunlop shot. Can Dunlop win the Daytona 200 yet again? Regain the crown, or will Pirelli continue their streak? To the high banks we go. Only a couple of laps remain once they get to the stripe. Mm, now Brandon just pulls up alongside Josh Hayes to let him know, hey, I'm here, and it, again, does he let out of it? Is he running out of gear? What is the what is going on there with Brandon Posh? Maybe that was his first little run at seeing if he's going to be able to have the power to go past these guys. Sheridan Marias trying to get to the Daytona 200 and claim it all. What we do know is if these four make it to the stripe, there's three of them. It'll be their first time winning the Daytona 200. Or can Brandon Posh repeat? So much traffic now. Three of them, four of them get around traffic, no issues. But Marias, endurance racing experience, has raced around the world. With less than two laps to go in this 200 mile long race, this 57 lap affair, Sheridan Marias looks like he's in the catbird seat, but Jason Pridmore, it's all about, do I lead out of the chicane or wow. do I not? What a position Camp Peterson is in. He's got a mentor in front of him. He's got a guy in Josh Hayes that coached him. Uh, I mean, he is just sitting there thinking, I'm, I'm here. I've, I've made it this far in the Daytona 200. What is Camp Peterson thinking right now? What is he going to do? He knows he's got Josh behind him, a veteran. And they got Posh behind them, who's won here as well. So there's just so many thoughts. And you know, Marias has done his homework. He knows he doesn't want to necessarily lead out of here. Will traffic become a play? I'm looking as they 
to get by these two back markers. They're going to get by them before the trioval, and we should have a clean run to the flag after they get by these two back markers. They should have a clean run to the flag, Greg, these four guys. Four riders up front and only three podium spots to occupy. Now it's the run. As they come to the stripe, the white flag flies. This is it. The last 3.56 miles to decide who's going to be Daytona 200 champion. Marias up the inside of Cameron Peterson. He's going to take the point a little bit wide. Peterson trying to square the corner up, get the drive, but Marias will hold on to it. And now as a matter of, it looks like Marias is trying to break away. It looks like he's, he went in there really deep, Greg. And let's see if he has any kind of gap. He's got the smallest of gaps as he exits the International Horseshoe for the final time. He's going to bend it into this fast kink, this fourth gear on one of these little 600s. They're going to go back two gears now, back to second. All these guys on the limits as they roll off into the second turn, uh, second horseshoe here at Daytona. And now the drafting wars are going to come into play. You can see Marias gets out over the paint first First time I've seen him do that the entire race, Greg. And now he tips in to turn six. And now it's just a matter of have you played your cards? Is this where you want to be? You can see he has a little bit wider exit than, than did Cam. Cam pulled up a little bit of time on the exit of that corner and was able to bring that gap closer. Who's going to want to lead out of the chicane? Will it be the right move? Here comes Cameron Peterson. He's up high. He's in the draft. Here comes Brandon Posh. Posh, either he doesn't have the gearing or he refuses to take the lead. So into the chicane we go. And it's going to be Cameron Peterson's hard on the brakes, but he gets it slowed down. So they're going to leave it to Sheridan Marias. Out of the chicane. Who's going to get a drive? No wheel spin. Here we go. This is it. Marias has a look over his shoulder. Up to the high banks we go. Here comes Brandon Posh. Now he's showing the legs of the triumph. He's dropping down. Josh Hayes is there as well. Marias is hung out to dry all alone up top. Now it's Posh trying to find position. Hayes, he's going to have to move out of the way. Who's going to have it? Here we go. The drag to the checkered flag. Cameron Peterson up the inside. Here comes Posh around the outside. And it's Brandon Posh wow. who will take victory by seven thousandths of a second. Unbelievable. Wow. And the triumph of Posh denies the trio of Yamahas the top spot at the Daytona 200. Well played, Brandon Posh. Unreal. I mean, you could just see it all race. The kid was so patient. And you can see that, that logo on the front. The New York Car Club boys, they're all pumped for him. They've been supporting him since day one. You can see here also you got TOBC. That, those guys just win the 200 all the time. TOBC, <laughs> they only see him once a year. And they win the Daytona 200 again. Brandon and Posh defends, defends his championship, Greg, from last year. Unbelievable. Well, Jason, in the end, the gamble for the tires and the pits paid off. And once again, Brandon Posh back to back on the triumph after spending a year in BSB for the fans. Jason, masterful race. Unbelievable. Like, what do you say? I mean, you think about it and what this guy did. He fought his way to get back to the front. He fought his way after a pit stop that, that was just as good almost as everybody else's. He said to me this morning, he says, Jason, this is the best I've ever qualified and the field's more stacked. I feel like I have something for these guys. And boy, did he. I mean, what a show of pure patience the entire race. I mean, he led the first lap. And I don't really remember him leading too many more laps after that other than the last. That's the most important one to lead. He surprised them all. And this is the finish, Jason. And just like that, that is what seven thousandths of a second looks like. And that's what one tenth of a second looks like all the way back to fourth place. A heartbreaker for Josh Hayes oh. without question. But congratulations to Posh Cameron Peterson, seven thousandths of a second away from winning his very first Daytona 200 as a rookie. Sheridan Marias will stand on the podium as well. Richie Escalante is in, in fifth spot. Danny Eslick in sixth, so he doesn't get his fifth. Maybe next year, tip of the cap to Harry Truelove, the 444, coming over here from the UK, gets seventh place, he wanted a top eight, and he got it. Jeff May in eighth, Hayden Gillum ninth, and Josh Heron in tenth. We'll have more from the Daytona 200 when we return. Roger Hayden sat alongside, uh, alongside me, Michael Hillers, Brandon Pash, wheelies his way, just burns out around this uh, 3.5 mile road course, 69, one thousandths of a second splitting, not the top two, not the top three, but the top four.
That was one heck of an 80th running of the Daytona 200. Well done, Brandon Pash. Yeah, what a what a last couple laps from from Brandon. Even with all those old tires, is still about to do that pace. We didn't know. We was watching him in the draft the last couple laps, and he would catch up and fall back, and he kind of was seesawing with the guys, and you didn't really know what he had. But the uh, last lap, he put himself in a uh, perfect spot, and uh, now he gets to celebrate. Yeah, he'll be celebrating. Triumph will be celebrating. And Pirelli will be celebrating as well. You can see the headlines, can't you? Uh, Brandon Pash triumphs at uh, the Daytona 200. See what I did there, Roger? It was pretty good, actually. <laughs> Not bad. Just behind the top four, Richie Escalante finishes in fifth. Danny Eslick recovers into sixth position. What could have been uh, for Danny? And, of course, for Josh Herring, who comes across the line on the uh, HSBK Warhorse Ducati in tenth position had they not had issues, but taking nothing away from Brandon Pash, he successfully defends his Daytona 200 championship win. Back-to-back -back wins for Pash. Can he make it three in 23? Uh, I think so. I mean, to be able to do it back-to-back, -back, two different bikes, two different teams, obviously. Uh, Daytona's a special place, and some people just have a knack for getting around Daytona, and it seems like Brandon knows how to do it. And for a young guy, the patience he has. Yeah, absolutely. That was a very mature ride, a very good ride. Uh, great to see TOBC back here. Uh, Danny Eslick there just explaining, I think, to Brandon what uh, troubles he had. But nevertheless, uh, two triumphs in the top six. Uh, that is uh, good for Moto America Supersport this year. Yeah, and, it, and just for, you know, Brandon do this one-off race. And, and what about Sheridan Morales, another guy, uh, you know, just a single rider team here against the big guys. Uh, had pace all day, rode great. You could tell it looked like the last couple laps he was trying to make a break, and you know he was right there for the win. And he uh, he's probably going to be disappointed being that close to a win, but he had a he had a great performance. Yeah, he can hold his head up high. Showed him right. So too can Cameron Peterson as we get a burnout. Uh, the rest of uh, the riders coming in. Jeff May getting a faceful of Pirelli rubber as Brandon Pash comes under the Rolex. Well, he said yesterday in the pit stop challenge it would be nice to have a Rolex on each wrist. He's got his wish. Yeah, he's going to have it tonight. He's going to have a Rolex on one reach, each arm. And uh, look at him celebrating. That's what it's all about. You yeah, know, you put in all that work for this right here. Yeah, love it. I love seeing the raw emotion. Uh, in victory circle uh, the whole team come down here and uh, this is also an emotional race as well isn't it TOBC back in the Moto America paddock and uh, great for the team great for the manufacturer gr great for everybody yeah it's great and hopefully this could be something to come they can do more races and even be back in Moto America full time obviously they got a great crew to come here and win Daytona 200 I mean it takes more than just the rider it takes a great crew as well so obviously they got a good group of people there and uh Hopefully they can do some more races throughout the season. Yeah, Michelle there on the right-hand side, team owner, uh, all delighted down there. And as you said, uh, Cameron Peterson, for a rookie, uh, no disgrace at all there, was it? Seven one-hundredths of a second, 007. We're going to have to start calling him James Bond when he gets back on the superbike. But that was a really impressive uh, uh, Daytona debut uh, on the super sport machine for Cameron Peterson. Yeah, it was. And for a guy that hasn't rode a super sport bike in seven years and also never been to Daytona, you know, doing his first 200, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. It looks like in about five laps to go, maybe he got held up in some lappers because he lost uh, two seconds in one lap. So I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, he put himself in a, in a great spot. It looks like he had it. I mean, if the finish line would have been a little bit sooner, it would have been Cam Peterson's, but he rode great. And he's adapted to the 600 really quick. You know, they didn't get a lot of laps on it, uh, didn't get a lot of laps here at the race and to come here and you know, be that close to the win. He's going to be disappointed. You would think, oh, I'll go second in the Daytona 200. I'm going to be excited. No, not when you're that close. Not when you can taste it. Yeah, Jake Gagne there, of course, uh, who retired from that race after a spill this morning. He's now being congratulated to by Sheridan Marias, uh, his countryman. And uh, isn't it just good to see that everyone there is just celebrating? Uh, you know yourself, when you've been in a race like that, uh, you're surely you're going to be disappointed not to win the thing, but uh, you can't be disappointed with your performance. As I said, 69 one thousandths of a second covering the top four at the end of 200 miles, Roger. I mean, uh, impressive racing. Well, well, I mean, all you want to do is give yourself a shot. And the, all four of the top four guys, even Josh Hayes, they all gave themselves a shot there at the end. And uh, it's all about the draft, you know, sometimes you're in the right spot, sometimes you're not. And that's what makes Daytona so special and also what makes Daytona so hard. So many things come into play here. You know, not always the fastest guy wins. You know, it comes down to the draft and, and the strategy as well. 
It does indeed. I know a lot of British fans are watching. Uh, Harry Trulove, uh, we're talking about rookie riders and Cameron Peterson finishing second. What about that, Roger? Harry Trulove in seventh place for the TSC Yamaha team uh, and finished literally 74 one hundredths behind Danny Eslick, almost in the top six. Brilliant ride from Harry Trulove. Jeff Mace uh, just behind him in eighth. Uh, Hayden Gillum, Josh Herring, and the second of the True Love brothers, Matt True Love, finishing in 12th position. They can jump on a plane and uh, head back across the pond with their heads held high as well. Yeah, I think so. Now, hopefully they can come back and do the race again next year to, to have such a solid fir first time here. And so much to learn, you know, new bike, new team, a new track, and, you know, another country. It's not easy to come here and get a top seven, and not only just a, a top seven, but his lap time's consistent. His best lap was a... 50.6, and that's just right up there with the, with the best of the best. Yeah, absolutely. As quick as Richie Escalante, wasn't he? So uh, really, really impressive performance from Harry Trulove. Now you can see uh, the fans down here, a lot of fans around the circuit, a heck of a lot of fans down there in Victory Circle, the various TV broadcasters down here as well, uh, all of the team personnel. And uh, I've got to say, it's been a very successful weekend uh, and a really good event uh, to kickstart Moto America's 2022 season. Yeah, it's been great. Every race we've had to has been a draft finish. It just went down to the, the wire every race, so it's been a it's been a great start. The the weather, you know, played uh, through a couple curveballs at us, but all the teams and Moto America did a great job adjusting, and we've got everything in so far. We have indeed, and we can confirm that there is another race still to come. So uh, if you are watching on Moto America Live Plus, don't even think about turning off your uh, device uh, that you're watching us on. Uh, make sure you stick with us because we have race two of the Twins Cup coming up. As we see Brandon Pash going across, uh, he might need a new trophy cabinet uh, soon uh, as he's now got the, uh, the second uh, golden trophy. Runs across there to, to see some of the team. The podium finishes uh, up there as well. I can see uh, Hannah Loper, uh, who I'm sure will be uh, grabbing a word with the top three. The helmet there and uh, a, a sort of a, a different protocol for the podium. This is nice, this. I like the way that they, they celebrate the Daytona Yeah, 200. it's really nice. And that's also a really nice trophy as well for Daytona. Now he's got two of them. I mean, it's, take, it's taken up a lot, of, a lot of space in the trophy cabinet, but it's worth it. Yeah, and they look heavy trophies, don't they, as well? Uh, they don't look like little plastic trophies. They do look like really, really uh, uh, decent trophies. And that, that is going to take pride of place in Brandon Parsh's uh, trophy cabinet, no doubt about it. Uh, the Daytona 200 winner in 2021 and in 2022. Uh, for those fans that are here, come on, let's hear you. Let's see if we can uh, uh, get above the, uh, the noise on the TV cameras. Make some noise for your race winner, Brandon Pash. Oh, we can hear him. We can. <laughs> They're right below us. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether we'd hear them up here in the commentary box, but uh, absolutely uh, great to see. And the sun now shining down on him. Uh, absolutely brilliant stuff. As I said, the final race of the day is going to be for the Twins Cup, a shortened race of six laps. And uh, yeah, I can see the fans there giving us a wave, big smiles all around. And I'm sure everybody down there now getting their cameras ready to record this uh, important and uh, very exciting uh, protocol that we're about to go through. The podium finish for the 80th running of the Daytona 200, which saw triumph on top. Today's coverage of the Daytona 200 has been brought to you by Pirelli, where power is nothing without control. The 80th running of the Daytona 200 did not disappoint as it was that close at the finish line. Seven thousandths of a second for Brandon Posh over Cameron Peterson, Sheridan Marias, and Josh Hayes in the mix. And as you saw, Richie Escalante ends up 46 seconds back in fifth place. Danny Eslick trying for his fifth. He ends up in sixth. Let's get right down to Hannah, who has our Daytona 200 winner. And Greg, a back-to-back -back Daytona 200 winner at that. Brandon, when we spoke earlier in the weekend, you said you feel like not a lot of people are worried about you. There's not a lot of eyes on you. I've got news for you. All eyes are on you right now. With the team's decision not to change tires on that second pit stop, what was your strategy to get you to the end of the race? Uh, honestly, when I came in, I expected to get a new rear tire. And when they were like, no, we're not changing the tire, I about poop my pants. So, uh, yeah, I'm surprised I was able to go that fast at the end there on that used Pirelli. It definitely had a lot of grip. So shout out to Pirelli and the whole TOBC Racing Triumph team for an amazing package. And uh, that one was for Jason. Congratulations, Brandon Posh. Let's get over to Jamie with our second place finisher. And that's Cam Peterson, who went from trying to figure out Daytona International Speedway on Friday to being up second place finish. But I heard you talk to Richard Stamboli. You said, I had it. Take me through those last three laps and what happened. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously the beginning of the race was pretty crazy, you know, everybody was battling and uh, I came in for the second pit stop and my team absolutely crushed it. I think I came out with like four and a half seconds in front of the other guys behind me. So, uh, yeah, it put me in a really good place and then, you know, I kind of got stuck in no man's land and uh, a little bit of traffic and no draft. But, uh, yeah, you know, I thought I put myself in the right position coming to the start line and I thought I timed it to perfection. And, uh, you know, at the last second, I felt Brandon uh, uh, taking my wind away. I even stood up on my bike and tried to push it forward. But, uh, yeah, you know, my first ever Daytona 200. I'm so stoked to be up here on the podium. Uh, hopefully we get to come back for many years. And, uh, yeah, just massive shout out to the whole fresh and lean attack progressive Yamaha team for putting a great effort and, and you know, building a bike that can go win races. So uh, well done to the rest of the guys. It was pretty fun racing with uh, Shez again and, and, and Brandon. So, uh, yeah, let's go. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a little bit of confidence for, for the Moto America season. So let's go. After that effort today, watch out for the next time. Let's go to Hannah. Third place today goes to Sheridan Marias. A full circle moment for you. You came here in 2020 to compete in your first ever 200, and that race was not to be but redemption here with a podium finish. Take me through that race. There's so many factors that go into a successful race. What were the ones that stand out the most to you that helped you get here? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to break away so bad, but it just seemed impossible. I put my head down, and within a couple of laps, somebody would be flying by. So. Um, but it made it fun. Like that was probably the, f the most fun I've had in a race because it was every lap someone else was there, and um, especially like mid race, there was a massive bunch of us. So yeah, I think what got me out was put my head down to catch Cam. I think that race should have been his, but um, we put our head down and created like a little cycling bunch and just went for it. And he got a bit of traffic, so fortunately we caught back up to him. He still whipped me, but um, we had an awesome race to the line, so I had a huge fun there. Yeah. He's over here laughing behind you. Congratulations to Sheridan Rice rounding out our Daytona 200 podium. <laughs> Cycling bunch and, you know, Cam Peterson wanted the bike toss to try to win. <laughs> but uh, listen, we'll wrap things up from the Daytona 200 when we come back. Stay with us. Well, Roger, here we go. Brandon Parsh left center stage, and rightly so, the winner of the 80th running of the Daytona 200 here at the International Speedway. Uh, wasn't sure we'd get this race in today after all the rain. But I tell you what, uh, I'm glad we stuck around. That was a belter. Yeah, that was a that was worth the wait, definitely. To have four guys going at it that the last lap like that was uh, was. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still shaking because you just didn't know what, <laughs> right, what was yeah. going to happen. I mean, they was changing so much, and those guys were getting such big runs off NASCAR 4. You didn't know who had it. And actually, I wasn't even looking at Brandon Posh. I was looking more at, you know, the other three guys. And then I seen him, you know, swing by on the outside and got a great run. And good for him and good for that team. Yeah, absolutely. All three riders, uh, they're looking forward to the rest of their seasons. I know Sheridan will be heading back uh, to the World Endurance Championship. Brandon uh, will, of course, be a full-time rider uh, in the Moto America Series. Oh, there he is, the second Rolex he's now got. Uh, that is, uh, look at the smile, says it all, doesn't he? Doesn't it? Uh, Brandon will be riding uh, for uh, the Alta Suzuki team in Stock 1000 and in the uh, Superbike Championship of Moto America, which kickstarts at the Circuit of the Americas in a couple of weeks. And uh, as Cameron Peterson said, he too now full of confidence, Roger, heading into the 2022 season. I tell you what, he can hardly lift that after all that effort. He holds the trophy aloft. The fireworks are uh, kicking off down here. All of the pyrotechnics. We see the top three bikes there in victory circle. Everybody on their feet, a cracking race. Stay with us because Roger and I have got the Twins Cup race coming up after this short commercial break. <laughs> 